down and goal. Fields, please. That's Carl Malone. Street, he scores! Well, hello, Chicago. You are turned into a big time Sunday sports night in Chicago with the voice of Chicago sports fan. Chicago Sports Podcast, sponsors of the Madhouse. Good Sunday evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm your man, Brandon Traxiot. We're counting down 32 days until the 2024 NFL Draft, a.k.a. D-Day. The day the Chicago Bears announce to the world the man who will be their next quarterback. Chances are the Bears have employed more uh, starting backs than years who've spent cheering them on. Chicago's next uh, starting QB will be the team's 47th since Jimmy Mack himself. Jim McMahon generaled the Bears' victory in Super Bowl XX. Is Caleb Williams ready to be the man in Chicago? Tonight we break down whether USC's uh, Heisman Trophy winning QB and the Bears' consensus number one overall pick is the franchise quarterback material uh, with one of the greatest Chicago Bear players of them all, Mr. Defense. Our guest tonight hit like a human freight train and played with a lion's heart. This iconic Bear safety was the namesake and inspiration for Buddy Ryan's famed and game-changing 46 defense, which terrorized the NFL and rewrote the league's record book during the Bears' legendary 85 Super Bowl winning season. He's been voted one of the top 100 players in team's history out of 140 or 104 years, not 104. <laughs> Even at 71, he lives, breathes, and speaks Bears football from the heart. He is the legendary Doug Plank. Doug, welcome back to the Madhouse, brother. Wow, guys, I couldn't have said it any better. Wow, that was, Doug usually it was you, you're a late hitter. You're a cheap shot artist. That's, what, that's, the, that's my interviews in other cities. That's my, I love Chicago. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Hey, hey, Doug, uh, really quick. You shut down, uh, scouted, evaluated, and witnessed more elite NFL quarterbacks in your lifetime than any of us will ever see. What do you see when you watch Caleb William on film? You know what? I he, he has he has some really really great uh, things that he does, but you know there's a lot of quarterbacks out there that had a lot of look at our look at our past quarterback that looked like a race car with no dri- no no uh, driver's wheel, and uh, right. and you know what he he could go fast, he could tear things up, he could throw hard, throw throw the ball down the field, so. After seeing that not go as well as I thought it would go in Chicago, you know, coming from Ohio State, obviously I, I had a connection there with Ohio State, hoping the best, you know, that things would work out. But, you know, I just – it was it was hard to explain. I, I do think that some of the game planning has to have something to do with it. Uh, I, I look at what San Francisco does with their quarterbacks. They're very efficient. They, they throw the ball on time. They, they, they run plays that are open. They're not running for their life. How do you judge a quarterback like the one we're just getting rid of, you know, Ohio State product, and he gets sacked eight times in his first outing, and he's an athlete. He can run. He can get away from people. Eight sacks? you got to be kidding me. So it, this wasn't all just about the quarterback as much as people would like to make it. And because now he's out of town and all of a sudden now everything is going to be made whole, I don't, I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't either. There's, there's something else to it. Uh, but we're going to break it down and we got a bunch of questions for you. So I'm really excited to, to dig into this, dive into this, because we're excited to have you here, brother, once again. Well, if you were t- talking about, uh, me running up and hitting somebody in the chest full speed. Hey, I'd be all for it. I'd have all the answers. <laughs> I'd have all the technique. Uh, you know what though? That stuff. You know, I got knocked out a lot. Uh, I, I'm a lot. I have a lot few, fewer brain cells than when I started. Uh, I've replaced two shoulders with titanium and two knees. And you know, if you're on a railroad tracks, you're going to do some damage to some people, but they're going to do some damage to you too. And there is no such thing in sports 
as the hitter <laughs> and the hitty. The hitter doesn't get all the joy and the hitty doesn't get all the pain. You're talking about collisions that break helmets. Right. Two helmets in my in my family room, one from Ohio State and the other one from Chicago Bears, and they're cracked. Those helmets are cracked. And I oh. show people and I go, you think the NFL was fun? Try putting this helmet on here. And go run into the, the wall or the island I have in the kitchen. Tell me, come, tell me, come back and tell me how, how it feels afterwards. It's not the greatest. Right. Yeah, it doesn't sound the greatest either. Hey, you hey, know. Doug, how you doing? I'm Dustin Jones. It's a pleasure. Hi, to meet you. Hey, hey. So we got some questions about Caleb Williams, but I'm just curious since you just said what you said. Um, is there a hit that stands out to you that you laid on someone that you know just really sticks in your head that uh, you, you felt really it? Want- yeah, the only one I got fined for was uh, Jimmy Giles on a Monday night. Uh, he was a Tampa Bay tight end, uh, all pro. And uh, I got I got injured the week before playing against the Steelers, broke four ribs. I didn't play one day, one practice that week. I thought I was going to watch in from the stands, from the press box. And I go down there and I see my locker is completely filled with u- a uniform, helmet, shoulder pads. And then Buddy Ryan comes over and says, Doug, we changed our mind. We think you should play tonight and you should hit Jimmy Giles. I go, oh, really? I said, what are you going to do about my, I can barely breathe my lungs. I said, I didn't practice all week. He goes, go over there in that room over there and there's some lights on in there and they're going to take care of you. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Uh, Oh, yeah, they took care of me. Uh, I didn't feel (laughs) most of the things from my neck down the rest of the night. and uh, But it was good enough to play and I hit Jimmy Giles. And uh, initially they tried finding him finding me like $10,000. Uh, that was the year I made like 60000 So you figure it out. That was, that was more money than I would have made in that game. And uh, there's one thing they did. I told them I, during warm-ups, I said, I can barely tackle anybody. I, I said, to hit anybody, it's so painful. What could I do tonight? And that's when they suggested going in there. And, uh, you know, we had a doctor in there and everything was taken care of. And I had no pain from the neck down. And um, so I, I said, I tried tackling during the pregame. You know, I couldn't tackle. I couldn't wrap my arms around anybody because it hurt too bad. One thing I could do, I could run full speed, put my head down, and just blast them and just knock them off their feet. And that is exactly what happened that night. Um, <laughs> you know, the tight end, when you're in a coverage called cover two, which is two safeties deep, the corners jam, the receivers, and the open is middle, is wide open. Buddy Ryan ran cover two that whole night, baiting Jimmy Giles to come down the middle. And at the end of the first half, he finally came down. He said, Doug, I only want you to do one thing. You line up in every single play, tell yourself, Jimmy Giles is coming down the middle. Jimmy Giles is coming down the middle. And sure enough, here's this play. He takes an inside release of the linebacker, Bruce Heron. And now he is beating it right down the middle of the field. Of course, we got cover two on. Listen, I watched him a whole night. I took, that's the only guy I watched. I, re, I went running over there. I'm not saying I wasn't going to spear him. I was. But I was going to spear him where I had power. And I could coil myself and at the last and explode into Jimmy Giles. The problem was Bruce Heron was guarding him at that time, a linebacker we had. And he tripped and fell. So now he's stumbling right alongside the receiver. And I had to make a decision. If I kept running at Jimmy Giles, Bruce Heron was going to hit me right in the knees. So I decided at the last second before Jimmy Giles got there, I was going to leave the ground and I was going to put my helmet right between his numbers. And I was going to do as much damage as I could. And I did. And did. <laughs> exactly he what you did. He, he, he didn't play the rest of the game. But his, his production went down 50% the remaining season. And I don't blame him. You know, I wouldn't want to run down the middle of the field, turn my head, and let somebody come running at me full speed with a helmet on and hit me right in the chest, and I get knocked on my back. Um, yeah. No, that, that's why I play defense. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be a receiver. I don't want to get hit. I want to be the hitter. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> Yeah, my man. So redirecting back to Caleb Williams, you know, he fits the profile of a culture scout's dream, right? Based on everything. Yes, he does. That we've seen. Honestly, he does. Yeah. And yeah. I don't mean 
you know, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I, I've seen him play several games this year. You know, a couple he lost. You know, so he's not a one-man show. He's even as great as Walter Payton was. He couldn't carry a whole team. And you know, so I, there's a lot of things that he does right. I, I just hope that this the same treatment that we we saw saw with this last quarterback that he doesn't get put on that same program. If you guys understand what I'm saying, you know, the game plan, you know, the choices, you know, give him opportunities to show he, he can show his physical skill. And I'm not saying that didn't happen with the prior quarterback, but you know, when you stick a quarterback back in the pocket and you tell him, keep looking downfield, looking downfield. Well, that's great, but you better have some blocking to go along with it. Otherwise you're going to get killed. Doug, Dan, Dan Blake's here. Uh, I was wondering, looking at looking at Caleb, what do you find to be his greatest strengths? I think he's a strong kid. I think he's very, you know, physically strong. And I think, you know, God knows, he, he's been yelled at a lot lately. You know, for as good as he is, athletic, he's fast, he's quick. Um, you know, there, there's been some people that have been critical of him in some of the things that he's done. Um, I, I just think football – is more mental now than ever before. It, you know, it was always physical. You always had to tear the guy's heart out, you know, and never let him get up off the ground. But now it's much more mental going on. And quarterbacks, especially back in the pocket, they have to make the right decisions. I don't care how tall you are, how far you can throw the football, how fast you are. If you make bad decisions, you, your team is not going to win. You could be the most gifted player in the world. And you and I, we've all seen players. I've seen players through my career. I don't, I'm not going to mention names. They were all like 6'2 to 6'5, fast. They could run. They could throw 80, 80 yards down the field. But they weren't good quarterbacks. They weren't good leaders. They didn't get in that huddle, and they motivated everybody. The difference between a good coach and a bad coach isn't so much as mechanics. It's about his attitude and his communication skills. And if he can reach out like Mike did, he did when he came to Chicago Bears, you could argue all you want about him. Mike got you ready to play. He put you in a mindset that you were saying, bring it on. That we're the Chicago Bears. Bring it on. Ready and to run to a wall. We may not win this game, but you know what? You guys are all going to be limping off the field or carried off at the hospital. <laughs> we're, not, we're not taking any proof. And I love, I love, I love yeah. Mike Dick. And Buddy. And Buddy Ryan. <laughs> And buddy, for sure. Yeah, so this I'm um, Steve-O from Sh uh, Chicago Bears Central. Um, question about Caleb. So a little bit of my concern, it's not really – yeah, it's a concern, I would say. It's, don't get me wrong. The guy is talented. I've been watching him from years since he was in high school. I know he's a talented guy. My only critique with him was the, the – the college he chose because I knew in the system he was going towards, it's not predominantly a pro style system. So it's not going to showcase what he can actually where where he can really translate to the league. So, but I will say my only that's given me a little bit of ease is the coach staff that we brought in. And I believe I, I was cool either way. I mean, I was a Justin guy for sure, but when we brought in Shane and I seen the past work he did with the Rams he did in Seattle, I knew the type of system we did. Of course, we kept Sumo, and then I was like, okay, the, the, the sister's not changing that much, so he's just going to be adding on pretty much his passing concepts. So I'm like, okay, with that being said, how he treated, um, treated Gino, I don't think he's – when Caleb comes in, I don't think he's going to put too much on him, and that's the perfect – System, I will say, Caleb. Does that bring you a little bit of ease with Caleb yes, coming it in? Yes, it does. Honestly, okay. it, yes, it does. Because when I saw Justin back in that court, in that pocket, I could just tell there was frustration. He was not the same kid that was in Columbus, Ohio. They were putting a lot of pressure on him, and rightfully so. He's in the National Football League. I mean, yes. you should have pressure on you. That's the name of this game. Uh, but I, I just felt like, you know, there, there was there was never ever at any time in, when I watched Justin that he looked like he did back in Columbus, you know, confident, quick, he could run. He, he still did an unbelievable job those first few games, piling up yards, running to the left, running to the right. I mean, he could take off. And I, I just feel like when you start looking at some teams, you know, and, and I, I like to always pick on the, the, the 49ers because I think they have one of the best passing attacks going in the National Football Agreed. League. And they could take a, a person with 
I don't want to say normal talent, average talent, maybe maybe a slightly above that, and turn it into something that's very productive. You know, they got people running open down down downfield, and I didn't see a lot of that going on this year. I didn't see a lot of wide open receivers running struggle bears, and so I, I'm not so quick to want to just blame it on the quarterback and say now that we've shipped mm-hmm. him out of town, we're all going to be you know having fun and exciting and watching games and getting points scored and all those sort of things. Because, you know, even with that, you have to have a running game. If you don't have a running game and make people honest, you know, it works 50, 50, that passing mm-hmm. game, running game. I used to love to play against teams that passed the ball all the time or that ran the ball all the time, because you know what? You can forget half of your game plan and just concentrate on the things that they do. Cause they're just going to mm-hmm. keep trying to do them and over and over and over again. And, you know, I loved it. I mean, that, that meant I could run 12 yards full speed and run into those that two gap and three gap, you know, right, right there next to the center and guard full speed and try to hit somebody running through the, there with a little ball in their hands. Uh, it wasn't going to work out. And even like with that whole 46 defense, I give Buddy Cry credit for that. He came and said, Doug, you are no free safety. He said, how could you be leading the team in tackles and they have you at the free safety? Gary Fensick was the same way. If I wasn't leading the team, he was leading the team in tackles. So mm-hmm. that made it so much fun to play with Gary because, you know, we go back to that huddle sometimes and just start laughing about tearing up these guys, you know, hitting a quarterback. Yeah. But he was all about hitting a quarterback too. Every chance you could get. I used to laugh when he said, you know, you get an interception. He said, whoever gets the interception, you're going to destroy the, the receiver, the intended receiver, and the other guys go and get the quarterback. Now, if that happens very often in a game, let's say there's four, four interceptions, like we used to do sometimes. Four times the entire defense is going over, and they're and if you got there late, you just jumped on the pile. You just were adding to the fun. And I know that the, all those days have come and gone. Um, I still have a lot of faith in the Chicago Bears. I mean, I, I realized they were somewhat a little bit disappointing in terms of their production, points scored, those sort of things. But – I think they do to have a good staff and, uh, you know, may, maybe it's just one little thing that's different about, you know, what's going to happen now at the quarterback position. Maybe that's that little bit that just pushed them over the top because sometimes when you're close, it still looks bad. But when you get over that and you get the blocking and you get the play selection and you get the right quarterback, mm-hmm. it's magical. And now everybody feels confident. They're running back to the huddle. They can't wait to hear the next play. And they're actually giving more effort. I, I don't want to say players ever take off. But you know, when you get your rear end kicked, you know, over and over again, and you're behind in the game, it's really hard to be on an edge. You know, that's mm-hmm. what they, Gary and I would just would challenge each other. We're down like 21 points. We're going, man, time to crank it up. We're just going to, we're going to make somebody pay for this. And it was fun. <laughs> it was actually fun, even though, even though we were losing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll just say this, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm anxious just like everybody else to have a season come. I, I hope they make a, be- a good, better, a good transition. Uh, I, I think all the feeling sorry for yourself and all that's gone. It's gone by the wayside. And I think, you know, pl- people are just strictly planning on uh, making this the season better and more productive and let me say this too. There was plenty of guys that were supposed to make the difference when I was there. And I'm not going to ma- mention any names, but they didn't make they didn't make a difference. They they just they they had some physical skills, but they didn't have the verbal skills to communicate with most of those other players. And a lot of times it comes from the quarterback position. Uh, on defense, it's the linebackers. The linebackers communicate with the linemen and the defensive secondary, you know, Alan Page or Dan Hampton never came up to me in the huddle and goes, Doug, I want you to play better at free safety. I want you to guard that guy. No, it never happened. Now, Singletary, I had conversations with him. Uh, Mike came in, I think, just – he was just wanting to hit, so hit somebody real bad, and they wouldn't put him in the game. And uh, so, eventually, when I ended up leaving the Chicago Bears for injuries, and uh, he took my spot at the middle linebacker, I admire Mike because Mike – put his heart and soul in that 46 defense. And you know what? If you studied the film long enough from the end zone, 
you can see little things that the center, the guards, and the tackles do that tell you what the play is going to be, mm-hmm. whether it's run or pass, sweep left, sweep right. I, I, I shared all my secrets with Mike. I'm not saying he was great because of that. He studied. He, he did all the things that he had to do. He lined up and he was calling plays before the ball was even snapped. And Pointing at it. Guys were on the other side freaking out. They're like, yeah. how does he listen to us? How does he know we're going to play? <laughs> I mean, it was hilarious. And I, I know one thing. If you're, if you're at the free safety position and you see all these linemen line up, the center, the two guards, and they're leaning way forward on their hand, are they backing up? No. Run, yeah. You know what? That means it's a run. That means as soon as that ball snapped, bam, I'm off on a, okay. on a sprint. On a sprint to the line of scrimmage, full speed, and I want to hit somebody. It could be blocker. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. I know it's going to be a run. And, you know, it's the little things like that that differentiate differentiate the, the, the producers from the guys that end up on the ground. Mm-hmm. Doug, I want to thank you again for being on the show. Um, you alluded earlier to the San Francisco 49ers, and I agree with you. They're – Obviously, run a really good program there, and they make it easy for a quarterback to succeed. We just saw Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant in the draft, um, went to a Super Bowl. And we find the Bears on the opposite end of the draft. And uh, right. because Caleb Williams is the projected first overall pick, I think we've all, it's been really easy to focus on the phenom, the things he does well, his strengths. Um, but I want to know what you think about possibly his areas of improvement. What were some of his greatest weaknesses? You know what, though? When I watch him... Uh, again, I'm a big believer in a person that can speak and communicate with the rest of his players and do it where he gains respect. And he, and he does it through his production. You know, he, and, but he's, he's seeing things that most other guys don't see. But a lot of that is, is from the coaching. Also, you know, Kyle Shanahan, I think, is one of the finest coaches in the National Football League in terms of instruction, looking out for keys, like I was just talking about there, from an offensive perspective. Um why would you ever just line up sometimes and just run plays? You don't even know what the defense is. I, the 49ers, very seldom you ever see them line, just run up to the line of scrimmage and run a play. No, they're running motions and everything else shifts, everything they're allowed to do in the rule book. They do. Here's why. They be, be, because of the, all the things that they do on defense movement-wise, they can determine what the defense is going to be and what the coverage is and where the guy is that's going to be open. They don't just go back to the huddle or, and, and go back to the pocket, the quarterback. Oh, who's open? Let me see. Left, right. Oh, meanwhile, somebody's smacking him in the face. No. He knows when he goes back there who's going to be open. Let me just say this, too. Every secondary has a, a hero and they have a, a coward. And – you don't want to be dealing with the hero because he's willing to go out there and run and hit and cover and every all that kind of stuff. You want to find out who the Susie is. This is what Buddy Ryan said. We're going to find out who Susie is on the other team. And then we are going to make this game so uncomfortable for him. We're going to, we're going to take Dan Hampton and move him around each play. And so he's over top of Susie. He might be a guard. He might be a tackle. Listen, Dan just came off the line. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Now, you know what? You can handle that for a quarter. You can't handle it for the whole game. Somebody that's an all-pro in your face, bigger than you are, stronger than you are, and just beat the heck out of you, you're not You're not going to make it. And the other thing is, we all know, we all will watch these films too. We all watch <laughs> who the pretenders were. And if we saw pretenders either on special teams or on that offense, man, I would go out of my way. If I ever did a safety blitz and somebody came over and picked me up, I wasn't trying to get off the block. I, I was looking to blast that guy, knock his helmet off. You know, I was only 205 pounds. But, man, when you get running two or three feet off the ground, you can do some damage, mm-hmm. especially in the last second. You don't just run into people. You, there's a few feet before you reach him. You're all coiled up now like some kind of a snake. And the closer you get to him, you just uncoil and you just unload you with your forearm, your helmet. I'm telling you, you can bring a tremendous amount of force. Um, several times I've broken face mask from other guys. And um, that stuff just doesn't happen by accident. You want it to happen. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. I'm ready to go out there and start hitting people right now. <laughs> hey, yeah, listen. Man. Listen, it was my football. Yeah. My football was made. Yeah. It wasn't made to just watch people run in the end zone and fly, throw 50-yard passes. No, this is <laughs> this is about taking somebody's heart out of their determination. Yeah. And I don't want no moss. I don't want any more of this. <laughs> this is uh -huh. – I had plenty – the funny thing for me was guys that I ran into that were from Ohio State teammates, <laughs> and I would hit them like as a receiver or something. They go, I thought you and I were friends. What? Why did you hit me? Ain't no I friends said, out here. Because I have a coach that is going to take my job if I don't do this. So what I did was after that, I would look up every Buckeye on that pregame, and I would go over there. If they were on the offensive line or they were running back, i go – you know what? You and I were friends in Columbus. We're not friends here. We're not friends. And so don't expect me to go laying down or do a patty cake tackle or, you know, kind of like those just touchy feely things. No, I'm going to do everything I can to blast you. And uh, I, I had, I caught some grief from it. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not even, you know, loyal to your friends. I said, this isn't what this is about. I said, nope. if they want to be my friends, then they're going to put on a Chicago bear helmet. They're not going to be wearing <laughs> else's helmet or they're not going to be in my my position you know uh we traded a guy down to the saints and this was one of my funny stories he said he was in a he, he was an offensive tackle and uh <laughs> you know they were running up there they were running a scheme against us that week against the bears and then this receiver goes uh coach uh you just showed a pattern i'm not going to run i'm not going to run a crossing route against doug plank and gary fencing and he goes mm -hmm. Tell me why you're not going to run. He goes, because they are not very nice people and they're going to hit me as hard as they can. And the guy says, he goes, well, so you're saying you're not going to run that crossing route. He goes, that's correct. He says, you're done. You go, go turn your playbook in. You're released. Obviously the guy wasn't a first round draft pick. He was a later round, but I just laughed because thinking, you know what? I'm hitting other people. Now, I'm not hitting myself. Um, I never really thought about the consequences of getting hit hard. I, I wouldn't want somebody out there on the other side of the line of scrimmage trying to hit me. You know, and they were a lot of times, but I always try to keep them in front of me. And, you know, when they had their body turned, then I cleaned up on them. I got back. So it was it was a different day and age back then. You know, football was played a little bit differently. I think right now everything has to be precision. It has to be executed. It has to be done over and over again. And you have to trust the players that are alongside you because it's going to make a huge difference in games. Yeah, you know what? Speaking of huge difference in games, I got to ask you the billion dollar question everybody wants to know about today's game. I mean, fans have asked themselves over the last 30 years why can't this storied franchise scout, draft, and develop franchise QBs? What's going on? Um, you know, that's, that's a good question. You know, at first of all, I, I thought a lot of times it was because the quarterbacks were in a northerly climate. You know, they couldn't throw the ball as well during the season. They might be great during this early season, but, you know, they tailed off. But, you know, then you start looking at quarterbacks like Fran Tarkinen and Joe Namath and all these other great quarterbacks. You know, the Green Bay, I don't want to even mention all the names up there because <laughs> I'm still a Chicago Bear. Uh, they, how, could, how could they get produced quarterbacks? How, how could yeah. they? How how could they make guys that are leading the league in touchdowns and completions? And we we can't even come close. And you know it was a problem when I first got there. I mean we just weren't scoring points. You know it doesn't matter how good your defense is. You know I was in plenty twenty one to seven or fourteen to seven games or even seven nothing games. And uh, you know it, it's hard. It, it's hard. I'm not saying our defense was great. But we were capable of winning more games than we did. But you know what? If you if you let the other team score, get 14 points on the game, it was almost over because we were never going to get there or be past that. And uh, so it's a lot. The game is really mental. It's mental more than anything else. Uh, when you hit somebody, yes, it's going to hurt. But you know what? That's what you're there for. You're there to experience pain. And you, that's why you lift weights all the time. You know, that's why, you know, you just have a strong mental uh, position that, you know what, I'm not saying I didn't come out of games, but usually I was either knocked out 
or there was, I couldn't walk or something along those lines. I broke something. I, I snapped a ligament or broke a bone or whatever. Um, but back in those, those days, you know, they had things for broken bones and you were back out on the field <laughs> in a short period of time. And I think it was, it was a badge. Of, it was a badge of honor, you know, to do it and say, no, nobody's keeping me on a sideline. I'm not going to get over there and you know, go into the tent or whatever it was. Uh, no, there's there's nothing good happening in that tent. I don't want to go near that tent. <laughs> um, Doug, myself. Doug, and to be fair, you know, I, I got a question. It's it's a it's a burning one in my belly right now. I got to get it out. I'm sorry, Dustin. I got a no, you're good, Brandon. permission to break ranks. So here's <laughs> here's the deal, man. I, I watched the, the, the other day. I'm looking at our head coach. He's hanging out at a ball game, at, at a basketball game with the enemy. You know, he's hanging out with the enemy, the ops, man. And they're hanging out They're They're eating Cracker Jacks, sipping on, sipping on a Coke, <laughs> and they're watching a basketball game with a Packers coach. I mean, this guy owns you, bro. He is kicking your butt. You can't tell me that Buddy Ryan or freaking Ditko would be hanging out with the ops, no. man. There's no way. No, you're you're absolutely right about that. Uh, there was a here's one thing I did I didn't think was very appropriate. Um, they never would let you go over and even shake. This is least it was from the coaches that I had, except for one. And you could figure out who that was. You know, this person was more of a, a neighborly you know a person. Uh, but the, the first coach I had and the and the last one in being in Buddy. Uh, no, there was no going over and saying hi to anybody. You know. <laughs> unless you ran over, unless you ran over and hit him first, and then ran away. <laughs> Seriously, there there was nothing like that. And frankly, you know, you're thinking very bad thoughts all week. Like this guy did something to you or your family, and you know, you it was a mind game. It was a mind game, and and you watch these plays, and you saw him maybe double team a guy or hit somebody that maybe wasn't expecting it, or or maybe they were expecting it, and he just overpowered him. And blasted the guy. He's on the ground, you know, maybe like twitching, like he's almost going to die. And you're thinking, this dude is mean. I'll tell you what. And you know what? That was enough for me to get any motivation going that I had to. And, you know, there was plenty of times I came running up there. I saw the ball carrier going down. He was getting tackled. And I saw a lineman stand around that pile. Um, he, he went down. He was going down. I looked at it this way. The football game was an accumulation of periods and hits that I could get. And the more hits that I got was going to help us ultimately win a game in the final minutes of the game. So I did everything I can. Um, it was demolition derby for me. I was going to keep going till my legs said, no, wait, no mas. I can't do it anymore. Uh, I took out uh, – actually, I took out – I hit a lot of people that maybe you didn't see me coming – Hey, listen, it's not my job to make you see me coming. You know, I never, I never, I never blamed anybody for sneaking, sneaking up and hit me in the ear hole. We used to talk about ear holes like that was our target area because you could knock somebody out faster hitting them on the side of the head than you could in the forehead. It's all <laughs> crazy stuff, guys. Um, I'm just saying football is more than just points on a board to yeah. me. No, yeah. yeah. This is more like life and death. And I'm not coming out of here. Uh, I know I'm not going to come out here normal like I, I started, but you know what? Neither is somebody else. And there's there's several guys that I hit that never played again. They got hurt. I'm not proud of that, but I know that in this, on the same consequence that somebody would be glad to do that to me. And, um, you know, there was there was no getting going to the pro you know when i first got the nfl how you got to the pro bowl was the other players on the other teams voted for you i'm not saying i'm a great player but was i did i really deserve a unanimous pathetic terrible late hitter <laughs> you know I, <laughs> couldn't it be like maybe he, he, he was he, he was a nice guy you know he he, he, he hugged this after the game or something <laughs> instead of he's pathetic terrible Get rid of them. <laughs> hey, Doug, it's awesome to hear these stories and, and to hear you talk about how a receiver would be afraid to go over the middle before they even played a game against you, you know, like, and obviously things are a lot different now in the NFL than they yes, were. They are. Yeah, yeah. But do you see a player in the NFL that 
resembles your style of play from back oh, then? Oh, really? No. Okay. You know, before before me at Ohio State was Jack Tatum. That's what a quick else, note. What else do you have to say? <laughs> uh, I, I just rest I rest my case. Yeah. No more Jack Tatum's coming along. You know, I used to knock guys out, and I'd come back to the sidelines, and the coach would say, Doug, that was a hell of a hit, but Jack Tatum could have done it better. I go, Ooh. he could have done it better? How, what do you mean? The guy's getting carried off. He's in the hospital. You know, he's he's not going to get played for, like, next three weeks. Um, I had plenty of double knockouts. Even, even, even then too, you know, where you're, you're just so determined that you're going to just go blast somebody, especially if it was a, a big name on, on the other team. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, someone said, did your mother drop you a lot when you were a baby? And I go, yeah, she did kind of a thing about it now. And I enjoyed every one of them, man. It was like, you hit the bottom at a rush. Uh, it just came through you. <laughs> and, I don't know. I, I think I think I think you have it has to be in you intrinsically, you, you know, internally. E- either you have it or you don't have it. And th- they call it a switch sometimes. I know they refer to athletes. Mike Singletary had to switch. He he absolutely did. And you know, when I saw that big old eyes, you know, the, the, he was ready to go. And uh, ready. It, 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 it calmed my nerves because I said I'm not the only one like this. You know, he's he's up there taking on knees and hitting people as hard as he could. And um, Mike, Mike, Mike turned into a great player. Yes, he did. Dano, you're up. So, Doug, Doug, with uh, all the additions uh, for this, Sorry, you, am I back? I lost. Yeah, I think a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Better now. Back. Can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. can. All right. All right. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, with all the additions this this off season, I think a lot of fans are expecting the Bears to uh, make the playoffs in 2024. But what do the Bears need from Caleb Williams to make the playoffs? Leadership. You know, I, I got to say. The, the, the most valuable asset that a quarterback has is leadership. And if you're, you're talented, you're skilled, you can do this, you can throw balls, you can catch it, whatever. It doesn't matter. If they don't trust you as a leader, then it's never going to work. You're never going to get that marginal player <coughs> on your offense to do the, uh, the unbelievable. He'll sacrifice his body to block somebody. He'll make the catch. He'll, he'll do everything. He, he won't make mistakes. He'll run the right pattern. He, he's always trying to block somebody, contain them. And when you don't get that leadership, I don't care how gifted the quarterback is. It really doesn't make any, it, but it doesn't make a difference. I mean, and I don't want to name names over the years of players that came in. How many quarterbacks, a lot of quarterbacks in the national football league were supposed to be, you know, the do all the end all they were supposed to bring, bring the team back to championships and super bowls. It didn't happen. Look at Kansas City. Nobody would have ever thought that Patrick Mahomes, I'm not saying it was anything bad about him, but who would have guessed that somebody would have turned into a quarterback like him? He's aware of where everybody's at. He does great things physically. Uh, He's willing to sacrifice his body. You know, from what I understand, he's got a great personality. He communicates with all the players, the linemen, the running backs. That's what you need. You don't need a stumble, fumble, fall guy that's going to get in there. Man, I'm so great. You know, when I hear some of these guys talk after the games and stuff like that, I go, you have no idea. I'm thinking to myself, this guy thinks he played well. He played terrible. You know, he threw interceptions. He went the wrong way. How, how do you act like, oh, he had one play in the game and had a hundred, about 50 bad ones. And no, this is a numbers game. It's about stacking up you know, yards and wins back to back. Here's what happens too in the NFL, just like in life. When you win a game that you aren't supposed to win, then all of a sudden, wow, I can't wait to take next week off. I'm going to, you know, get a lot of rest and go home early. I'm not going to lift any weights. No, you can't. You can't do that. This is when you're winning other teams in the league, even the bad ones say, you know what? We're going to take these guys out. 
we're going to hit them as hard as we can. They, they might have been a bad team on tape when you saw them, but when you go against them, you don't think we were on fire against the Steelers or the Raiders or especially the Raiders because the Raiders were like, they just got off the pirate ship, you know? They were <laughs> They were coming to take the the, 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 the uh, girls on the island for a ride somewhere. And, you know, it, no, it was like all at war. You know, when you when your punt returner couldn't even catch a ball before guys were coming down and smashing them as he's looking up in the sky and just wiping them out. And, <laughs> and when you watch film of that, you go, these dudes got evil intentions. And you know what? I'm coming to that stadium don't look at me. Don't touch me because I'm going after you. And, and it's not going to be one play. It's going to be every single play. And try to make it as dynamic as you possibly could at the very beginning of the game. Say, man, we're not going to take this. Don't don't be hitting our guys because it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. And Buddy knew the plays, the call, that, you know, we all could gangbuster in, that break down guys you know, knock them over. And then we got two or three guys coming in the back, you know, through, through a hole and uh, they're going to do some damage in that backfield. And, I, you know, of course now you, none of that happens. You can't see it happen. Um, but, you know, the fury that you got back in the huddle and of, of watching something like that, and especially if they, did, they were doing that to your offense or your receivers and things like that, you don't think we were going to do the same thing? I mean, um, it was going to happen. And, you know, that's why we studied film a lot individually, you know, more, more than just a team, especially when, you know, later years when Mike Ditka got there. And Mike was awesome because Mike was a crazy lunatic. And he was your Man, head coach. Sure. And he wanted to fire you guys up like he wanted to, like he wanted to go out and play uniform, get a helmet, and go out and start playing. And <laughs> That's what made it so much fun. I mean, you literally run back to the huddle, start high-fiving each other. <laughs> it was like the playground. And this is the NFL. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. It's great to hear about. Yeah. So, Doug, um, I think – so, coming into last season, like, you know, I had us winning a little bit over 10 and possibly 11 games, and it had nothing to do with the talent on this team. It was just due to the current roster that I seen that we had. I just knew that Luke Getsey and our coach staff will come in here and say, okay, if we come in here with the smash buck staff of football, we're going to run it down their throat. We're going to play with a tense. We're going to have that attitude. We're not going to ask Justin to do too much. When he's ready, we'll ask if we're prolonged, have we prolonged through the season, have we prolonged through the weeks, we'll add more and add more. And that's I feel like it's the best way to produce a quarterback. Now, you, you see everybody that we're getting Caleb Williams, he can he's this amazing throwing this, that, and the third. And I think they're just gonna throw it over the yard. And I'm like, I still don't see that happening here just of yet, because for one, to start that to have that mindset, you have to build that lineup right. And we've always we've always have when it comes to the current line, we're a better run blocking team than a pass protection team. Yes, so I are. thought we was going to run more. So to me, I feel like Caleb is going to come here and do. We should have did the same thing with Justin. We're not going to ask him to do as much when he's first coming in. But as we come in more and more, we're going to add and add. And then potentially when we build the team how we want. We are going to then throw it over the yard. But I still see in this style of football, the best teams have that certain attitude just like y'all. So in your thing, do you always think you need that attitude based on what you currently have? You know what? I mean, think of all the teams that you've watched over the years. They all have an attitude. I mean, look at how many Cowboy mm -hmm. teams and Raider teams and even West Coast teams, uh, Green mm -hmm. Bay you know, they all have attitude. Um, you know, New England, even there for a while, they weren't necessarily a smash mouth team, but they, they executed plays. They had Tom Brady and they had a whole bunch of people around them, uh, but they all believed in each other. And even though they were small little guys, even as their receivers, those guys hustled. They, they did everything they could to make this team better. They would dive, you know, on the hard ground and try to make incredible catches. I mean, just think about mm -hmm. that Super Bowl, you know, when 
the guys that were out there catching bass, you go, no way, he's not going to catch that. Oh yeah, they, they all went down there, and they, but it was believing in each other. And mm-hmm. what what frustrates me, it, and I'm not saying I'm trying to overplay this as a player, but you know what, you, you stop, you might start watching the game like where the ball goes. That's where most fans do. They watch the ball where the. I'm watching exactly. away from. The game. How, what is the backside? Are they protecting a the quarterback, or, or are they taking it easy? Or, or on defense, are there players that are going out there that are running towards the running back and they're going to make it look like they really want to tackle somebody and they don't want to tackle anybody. And they're, they're going to dive down at the ground or do some <laughs> other kind of a weak, weak imitation of a tackle or a block. And when I see that, as I did, I did broadcasting the last 10 years in National Football League on national radio. And – I really it was hard for me some games. Um, how can a guy, an offensive lineman, get called for illegal motion two plays in a row? He he was jumping oh. off the wrong step. Now the first time everybody looked at him as in a huddle, like you dummy, you idiot. Then we go, they go back to the line again, and he does it again. That's what I'm as a coach going. Get him get out. Him out. <laughs> he goes to the locker room. Takes his clothes off because he we're gonna we're gonna lose with him. We can't we can't win with him. And I mean, I had to take some deep breaths, you know, broadcasting the game. Going, what is he thinking about? He, he's got to be thinking about that was a Thanksgiving dear game. So I mean, he must be thinking about the turkey or something because it, it sure isn't this game. And and he would never ever. It's like if I got beat deep on a pass at free safety. Do you think I'm going to get beat the next play? I'm not going to be – I'm not even going up there. I'm 30 yards deep. You're not getting behind me. I don't care if you got a motorcycle. You're not getting behind me. <laughs> in front of me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what is the thought process of that person, of just saying two times in a row I'm jumping off sides? Uh, it's, it's things like that that just really – I just can't I can't fathom. You know, a weak effort on defense. Um Mis- misdirection on offense. And, um, you know, I, w- I, w- I was a quarterback in high school. I wouldn't want to be a quarterback my whole career because the worst hit I ever had, I'm, I'm looking like this downfield, and a guy came from the backside around the edge, and he hit me right oh. in the middle of the back with his helmet. I That is probably the hardest I ever got hit in my life. College, Ohio State, pros, Chicago Bears, it didn't matter. That – felt like that was the worst hit I ever had. Uh, obviously, I stopped being a quarterback like the next week. I said, somebody else, <laughs> somebody else take this job. I, I want to yeah. be on the other side doing, be, you know, making the blitz. Doing the damage. Yeah. And I thought about that. You know, when I, I thought about that often, when I, they, when Buddy called a, a blitz for me, a safety, and he didn't do it very often, maybe like once, once every four or five games, I said – to myself, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring as much as I can on this play, and I want to I want to cause as much attention and chaos as I can by uh, somebody that gets in my way, and because um, I know what it felt like when I was in that same position, and I never wanted it to happen again, and uh, and there was a few guys that. They they left the field after that. They didn't. <laughs> they they say, oh yeah, okay, look, we're gonna have some more of those. Let's call that same play. No, and they didn't call that play <laughs> ever again. And uh, but it, it's things like that. I mean, I I think it's that internal mechanism inside of, of players that some coaches can turn on. They can they can turn it on. You know, I, I was able to coach at Ohio State after my uh, NFL career. Uh, with Jim Trestle. He was a coach that was there for a number of years at Ohio State. Great success. And uh, he he was one of those players or coaches that really could just have that communication with your players. And it wasn't always about, let me go through the profanity, you know, file here, file book, mm. you know, that I can always just yell. You know what? You think players want to hear that in meetings? I, no. <clears throat> Would you address someone in a business environment like that? No, not of course. Of course, you wouldn't. You, you're you're appealing to their insides, their emotions, and 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 questioning them and saying, "Guys, we can do better. 
We can protect each other. We can win. We can really make something out of this. And when you start getting people like that in front of you that are talking to you, your whole psyche just changes because now you're not the lone ranger out there just trying to do your thing. No, you're part of a group, the 46 defense. Uh, a lot of times, yeah, I would have liked to have gone in there and hit the quarterback. That wasn't my job. Yeah. My job was to pick out a guard, a pulling guard or something like that, or a tight end. Uh, I, I'm not going to be chewing on the meat every play. You know, sometimes I got to go out there and, and eat some hamburger, you know, on the outside, somebody bigger than I was, but you know what, when you do it and they don't expect it to come your way. Wow. It's, it's incredible. You're and like, this is what they hate. yeah, exactly. You're, you're walking around going, man, we, I don't know whether we're better than this team. I know one thing, we got a better game plan and we are executing it right now. And when I left, you know, like in 85 or I'm sorry, 83, 84, that team just got better and better and better. And they, they believed, they believed in the coaches and there's no doubt. Think about 86. The team was still good, but it didn't have that chip on its shoulder like they did in 85. And that was because mm -hmm. Wilbur Marshall and a lot of other guys that were just fire and brimstone were not on that team anymore. And you go look in that huddle, and instead of seeing those mean guys, you know, it, looking back at you, you saw some other friendly faces, guys with maybe a smile on their face. <laughs> hey, I never saw a guy play in the NFL with a smile on his face. Uh, well, at least, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, I, I smiled I smiled after the collision because I came out on top, but I wasn't <laughs> smiling on the way in. I mean, it was right. like, this could be it for me. <laughs> I, I could be waking up in the locker room like half hour from now that happened <laughs> right. to me a couple times too Does hey everybody we got over 100 in the chat let's uh hit that subscribe button and uh like thank over you guys in the building right now for doug Plank, the man. Comments coming. doug bears fans love to watch you hit quarterbacks but i'm going to hit you with one more quarterback question pun intended okay, right. um do you think caleb williams is for sure the bears quarterback next season I, you know, I, I think number one, I think he's the best choice. And I think, you know, from a, from a, uh, uh, a, uh, standpoint of exposure and, and, uh, explanation and the things that he's done, I think he's, he's, he's the best choice for them at this time. Now there might be somebody else out there that has tremendous talent that we don't know about, or maybe was running a system in college that really didn't play to his strengths. There could be somebody like that out there again, that we we just don't know about it. So when you don't know about it, you got to just go on your on your your hunch. You know you got you you know he's he's good. You know he's got talent. You know he's got skills. You can test it. He is vertical. How strong he is. His durability. All those sort of things. Um, and, and here's the other thing: when you're involved in an organization, it might be in college. It might be in the, in the NFL. There's a lot of tremendous amount of pressure on you because. Now the public has a perception of what a person looks like, what they should be, what they what they're going to play like in the National Football League. It, it doesn't always work out that way. But here's my point: coaches are under so much pressure that if they don't make that choice and he goes somewhere else, like the Green Bay Packers, let's just say that for example, and now he's tearing things up. What do you Nobody think? Would. The team. The people, the fans, the media, what do you think they're going to do to you as a general manager, a head coach? They're going to tear you up. I mean, the, the criticism is going to come in, incessantly. And mm -hmm. you might find yourself, you know, on the road, you know, the fast car out of town also the next year. Because yeah. you let this person slip out of the grasp when you could have grabbed him and put him on your team. And so, you know, I, I think coaches are really their 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 walls are to the back, you know, back to the walls. They they, they have to make a choice, which from a public re stand public relations standpoint, is a good is a good pick. Speaking of choices, and you know, looking at all the measurables and stuff, when you think of like the prototypical quarterback, seven years ago we went and signed a quarterback from Tampa. For like almost uh, 50 mil. And this 45. is your guy that we got. 
Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> Mike Lone neck. The neck. The neck. The neck. He was supposed <laughs> to be the guy. He was supposed to be the guy. Post traumatic stress. <laughs> hey, oh, and some of, some of the snaps that we got last year that went over Justin Fields' head when he had to put his rocket pack on and fly to the moon and bring it down <laughs> like Michael Jordan with his tongue hanging out. And just to get a yard or two forward, by the way, after all that shit show, freaking it would have just hit right in Mike Glennon's neck. So he might have been okay for that, you know. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, through the years, I mean, it's got to be laughable, Doug. It's got to be it laughable. Is. You know what? We, we were always blessed, though, because when I was with, with the Chicago Bears, uh, we were always fighting the Minnesota Vikings for whatever the lead was. Green yeah. Bay was not doing very well. Bart Starr was the coach there. You know, they had many coaches or players and coaches, much like the Chicago Bears did before they got the 985. Uh, yeah. Detroit. Detroit was another bad team. You know, they were just historically team. Now, now, I'm not saying they played hard. They were very physical. They were like the Bears for the most part. But they couldn't score points, you know, through the 70s and 80s. And now, you know, that, that team has kind of changed. You know, I think they got better leadership now. You talk, I love looking at the sidelines during the game. It can tell me what is going on. If everybody's mm-hmm. sitting on the bench, nobody's talking, they're all spread out, they got a foot between each other. That's one thing. If you go over and you look at them and they're just they're being it's inspiring each other. And I hate to keep coming back to, you know, Tom Brady situation when they played the Falcons. When they were getting their butt kicked early in the game, Tom Brady is on a bench going up and down the sidelines, patting everybody on the back, giving them hugs. They're getting their rear ends beat. But you know what? What comes first? Is is it the turnaround or is it the energy and the enthusiasm that's going to make it happen? It just doesn't happen on its by its by its own. Somebody yeah. has to light the spark. Yeah. And if you don't have that guy, then it's never going to get done. And I, I just, it, it amazes me. I, I, I think, you know, I think a lot of that should be placed on quarterbacks because they're, they're responsible. They're the ones that get the ball. They're the ones that make everything happen. They hand the ball, they pass the ball. They, 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 they're, they're communicating with the, with the linemen all the time. That's, that's a really key position. And, like I said, I think people in towns that have struggled like the Bears for years and years, the last few years, you know, they're, they're going to put a lot of pressure on a general manager, an organization to hire the guy who they perceive as being the next superstar because they don't want to they don't want to have this Patrick Mahomes living over them for another 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the, the voice of Doug Plank. Number 46, the hitman himself. Uh, man, you know what? We could listen to this guy all day and night, but we I know we've taken up quite a bit of your time, and we really appreciate you. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Could you tell us really quick about your uh, that book about uh, walking the plank? Uh, it sounds it sounds really cool and riveting. Could you tell everybody about it? Well, I'll tell you, I'll, you know, I'll tell you exactly what it's about. It's about I'm so thankful that I played football because it taught me a lot about life. Uh, told yeah. me what to, what what not to do. Um, you know, my first day at Ohio State, uh, I, w- I was a running back, a quarterback, and a defensive back. And I get put as a running back. And a guy hit me. All we had on that day was T-shirts, shorts. And we were running around on AstroTurf at Ohio Stadium. And this guy tackles me. And he gets Damn. like a, like an alligator. He grabs my leg and rolls. Mm-hmm. That was my first day at Ohio State. My second day, I was getting operated on. So my entire freshman year, I wasn't – nobody touched me I was because I was rehabbing from a knee injury, surgery. So back, that was freshman, couldn't play at that time. That was back in way back in the 70s. I came back with a chip on my shoulder from uh, being a sophomore, and I just had to work my way from the fourth stream, string, you know, up to the next man up. I call that because I never really started at Ohio State. I, I had to have somebody go down first for me to get in the game. So – when I got to Chicago Bears, I go, these guys don't even know who I am. I'm just a backup guy at Ohio State. I'm going to light everybody up here in this lo- in this per- training camp. They're not going to know what hit them. When I went into that training camp, I was trained. I was lifting weights that whole summer. And when I hit that camp, man, I was ready to do damage. And 
in by uh, by the third preseason game, I was the starting free safety for the Chicago Bears. Let's from the, go from the twelfth round. That's I'm awesome. season that was. It can be done. It can be done. You have to you have to believe in yourself. And when someone yeah. says you stink, you suck, you're terrible. You just go, yeah, that's right. I'm I'm terrible. Wait till the next play. I'm going to show you how terrible I am. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it motivated it motivated me the whole way. I, I yeah. uh, that yeah. being a twelfth round player, a backup, and now you're a starter for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> Even tackles that year. So what does that tell you? That meant that yeah. I, my rear end was so anxious to get to that ball carrier. I didn't care where it was. I was going to get there and make the tackle, drill this guy, make him not want to get back up. And it was fun. It was like being at the playground again. <laughs> I've yeah. never had a more fun year than that first year because there was no expectations of me. And they, they just said, Doug, turn it loose. Go do it. <laughs> oh, man. I You know what? I always look and I tell these guys, and, and, you know, and they'll back me up on this. I always tell them, when we get a safety, I'm like, you know, I it, and it's the guy that we picked up the other day. And, Steve-O, you're pretty good at this. Who, what was that? the name of that uh, safety Byard. we picked up? Kevin yeah. Byer. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like, does he does he hit like Doug? Does he does he does he hit like Fensick? Uh, with, uh, you know, do they do they bring it? Do they do they bring it with everything they got every play? You know what I mean? That's that's what I look look at when we get a a safety a force multiplier because ultimately, like when you look at when you look at those rocket missiles that you guys were firing out out deep in in the field, man. You know, that was a force multiplier that brought energy and synergy and, and shot it through the entire stadium. And it, it lit a fire under other players that you had uh, under their ass. And I mean, when you see your teammate, you know, a guy that's uh, right to bear arms right next to you and he's firing away, that motivates you more than Buddy could have, could have done or, 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 you know, like honest to God, like it. I, c- I can't even tell you what it would be like to have Buddy, you know, and Ditka right there that, that is like automatic. You know, it, they will get you motivated. If you're not motivated, they will get you motivated. But to a teammate is a whole different level, man. That would have been amazing. You know, so Buddy, amazing. Buddy would say to you, like, if you're on the ground, what are you doing on the ground? Not me, but any other player on our team. I learned when I got my uh, knocked off my feet, I, I, I didn't know where it came from. But I practiced in practice rolling. So whenever I got knocked off my feet, I tried to hurry up and turn my body. So when I was going on the ground, I ducked my head and I rolled. And I got back up like that. I never was on the ground more than a split second. I was never <laughs> going to stay down. And you know what? I would practice it week after week. You know, And it happened in a game. If you don't practice it, it will never happen in a game. When you do it in a practice, nobody liked me in practice because I played it like it was a game. And Mike Ditka would say, Doug, Doug, stop, stop, stop. Go, okay, coach, I'll stop. No, I was on the next play. I, I hit somebody else. And yeah. you know, Saturday, I mean, Sundays were fun. You don't even have to think about it. You were you were getting back up on your feet so fast and going and hitting guys. One time on one play in special teams, this was my second year, three guys I knocked off their feet. Two of them didn't get back up that rest of the game. I got knocked them out. Three guys on one play. That still blows my mind. That was on a special team, a kickoff team. I was the guy right in the middle. And as soon as the kicker kicked the ball, I, I ran at him full speed. And I said, "What is he a man or, or what? Is he a man or a woman? We'll find out here. And usually <laughs> he, was down. he was down. I ran to somebody else. You know what? Three guys got knocked off their feet on one play. And a bone saying, pain. you know what? And I'm not saying I'm somebody great. I'm not great. I'm Mr. Average. I'm Mr. Average with a burning desire inside of me to want to uh, bring fame to the Chicago Bears. Not myself. I don't care about getting hurt, whatever. As long as I can bring some modem of respect to this team and have the, have the organization feel better about themselves and our fan base, because that's where it all starts. Right there, you don't do something for the fans. You don't deserve to be on that field. Hey Doug, when you're talking about Mr. Doug, when you were talking about Mr. Average with a burning desire, uh, it, you rem- rem- reminded me of my boot camp uh, drill sergeant. He used to tell me, he goes, "Hi, drill." He goes, uh, "Talent works hard when." Uh, no, wait. Uh, 
what what did he say? He said ta- uh, hard, hard hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yeah, that's it. Hard, that's hard it. work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. You know what I told him while I was doing push ups? But every time when he would go this way, I would go down and I put my belly on the ground. And as soon as he sees, <laughs> as soon as he starts turning around, I'm like. <laughs> he, he he looks the other way like Debo, you know. I, you know, I'd be talking, you know, but uh <laughs> seriously, man. He'd come over, he'd be talking all that smack, you know. And he he'd get I, I knew when to turn it on, you know what I'm saying? But I, I said, So what side of the fence am I on? Am I the talented or am I the hard worker? He goes, Keep do, keep doing push-ups and I'll let you know at the end of the if, if you're you know if you made boot camp, you know, because I was a loudmouth kid from California. Right. I had like surf surfboard. Wow. Here's the deal. January 14th. I know I'm not I'm not trying to take your show. This we're we're interviewing you, not me, but you got me fired up now. January 14th, 1997, <laughs> I come in. I've got my Hard Rock Cafe tank top shirt on, my surfboard shorts, my flip flops. The average degrees was 50 below. There was snow up to my knees, bro. And my drill, so I, my, my no, my my recruiter. I, I want to shoot the guy if I ever see him. I swear to God, he he told me. I said, "What's what's Chicago like?" He goes, "You ever seen a you, sh- you ever seen a Cubs game?" I'm like, "Yeah." He goes, "You ever seen Ferris Bueller?" Yeah. He goes, it's like that year round. You'll love it. I was like, dude. So, I was not ready, bro. I was not ready for Chicago at all. I could not imagine. None of you guys wore long sleeves, man. I don't know what it was like. I'll tell you why. Guys, it's crazy. You know why? When why? We played Tampa, and Tampa came up there. They had sweatshirts, hoodies on. They had everything. I mean, you couldn't. they couldn't barely move. They're moving around like this. I would come out like with no shirt. You know, I, even our guys, like on Saturday was the walkthrough practice. Sometimes I would show up in a jock strap. There was no women. At, there was no women at the event. But I'm just trying to prove wow. a point. I don't care about ice, snow. You know, it means nothing to me. I could have this jock strap on. I did this at the Bears facility. It went practice out there for two hours. And you know what? Guys are laughing their butts off. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm not cold. And you know that that game when we go out there, I got short sleeve shirts on. You know, I got everything, everything that they don't have. They've got all kind of shirts they can barely play, and uh, and we always destroyed Tampa when they came up to the Bears. You know what? They couldn't handle it. They just couldn't yeah. handle the cold weather. Yeah. And uh, we used it as as a, almost like a, something that we were very proud of going up to Green Bay. Same thing. You couldn't pull one over on those guys though because they were oh. used to. Oh, yeah. ice. So yeah. there was there was an ice battle up there, slip and fall, and uh, you know just knocking guys. You, you know, here's the other thing too: if you were running at somebody full speed on ice, you can't avoid them because you, you're it's too slippery. You're just you're a guy on tr- on rails. You're a train on the tracks. You're coming down. You're gonna smash somebody because you can't go left or right. All you can do is go forward because that this field is so it's it's a layer of ice, and to hit that sucker full speed, wow. Uh, I thought I knew pain in my life until I got fell down a few times up in Green Bay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Plank, thank you very much, uh, sir. Thank you for being here, thank Doug. You, Doug. Pleasure. It's thank you. Honor, Doug. Thank you. Have a good night, sir, and bear down. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Oh, man, that was awesome. What a blessing, oh. guys. Wasn't that cool? That was dope. <laughs> so good. Yeah, it was great, man. I'm ready to run through a wall right now. No, I know. Right, I've, been wanting, I've been wanting to do this all uh, episode. They don't, they don't call it hitting for nothing, man. That's, Dude, that's I ain't nice. seen Steve O smile like this in a while, man. It's been a minute since Steve O's had something like really like I watch your show all the time, Steve O. And you know, every once in a while you'll crack one, but you've been smiling ear to ear like the whole like this has gotta oh. be like your your like love language, bro. This is how uh, you feel uh, like football should be played the way uh, Doug spoke, right, bro? I'm a sucker for history for what? I mean, I'm young, I'm 23, but I, I do my history, so yeah, and it's just like I said, like I that's the style of football. I it was late, but I seen a little bit of it. And yeah. um, <clears throat> some of my favorite players, like my favorite player on the Bears right now is Brisker, because that's who he that's he kind of reminds me of the game. That's why I call him Crash Bandicoot. You just crash into things. You don't think about it. You don't think about it alongside with all the rest of our defense. So 
Yeah, this is why I, I, I was saying, like, bro, I, I, that's all I want to do. Hear, hear a legend talk. Like, I'll just sit back and soak it in. That's what Yada said. He said a lot of podcasts, you know, and I, I watch a lot of podcasts. So there's a lot that I like out, especially Chicago Bears. You guys are awesome, bro, Central. But I'll oh, tell you what, uh, he friends. said, you know, when you get a legend in the building, let him speak. I think Doug I mean, was being a little modest. <laughs> right? Average, he said. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Still yeah. players don't players that's today about, don't hit like that. Looks about right, like no. he's, you know, getting the most out of yourself. That book looks awesome. You know, I want I'm gonna check it out. You can get it on Amazon. I'm sorry, already Amazon. ordered. Walk the I'm sorry, ordered. Right. <laughs> already got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, that's what he was all about, right? Getting getting the most out of himself with his mental toughness, you know, and that's just awesome to hear him tell those stories. And we need players like that in Chicago because I I'm sick of watching these bears lose and get their, their asses kicked by the Packers. You know, we need that mental toughness on this team. And, you know, you wonder where it's coming from on this roster right now. Yeah. If you look him up on YouTube, it says HUD head Hunter highlights. <laughs> no joke. That's what they're titled. I mean, that guy got low too. I, yeah. I, 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 I did. Just want to, he is textbook, man. Honestly, textbook. I did want to just break out and just be like, "Do you know you're insane? Like, do you honestly <laughs> know you're in, like, you know you're not right now? Like, to play like that and to Bro, play fast, it, it just don't make every, sense. He put everything on the line, man. Guy put Steve everything he, on the line. His own health. Steve, he legit told me yesterday when I asked him, you know, reminded him because I, I, you, you gotta keep, you know, they're so busy. You gotta, you know, hey man, we good, we good, you know. Um, mm -hmm. he, when I was talking to him. He, he told me, he goes, I could play one game. He goes, I've kept myself in shape. I'm ready. Let's go. I believe him. I'm like, dude, I think he could in this day and age. He looks, like, he looks, he looks good for his age, man. He looks good. Right. He does. Yeah. He does. I mean, that's like that's like that Mike Tyson fight coming up. I would not be surprised if he dropped that dude. I, I cannot wait. No, I <laughs> hope. I'm praying. <laughs> I'll be done. I, I, yeah, it's time for, it's time for the uh, big man to fall for sure. <laughs> hey so we got a couple questions we got to ask you while you're in the building man i mean seriously when i was talking to bobby man he said you're well read you're all you're kept up like you know because that, that was the thing you know they you guys bust the the elder statesman's balls and and then they bust yours for being the young and you know but uh yeah. it's all in fun right but uh yeah. i know i just got i got a couple questions to ask you because i know uh primarily the whole thing about Justin, it's already left. You guys are moving forward. You're cool with it. But the, the deal is, you know, we're we're not just talking about Caleb here. There is a potential that we could go to uh one one B, you know, and that would be uh Daniels. Now, what yeah. what do you think what would happen there? Like what I don't consider it to be like nearly a hole that some people might think. What do you think we could probably squeeze out of that if if any, you know? You're gonna get some. You gotta have oh. some sort of trade compensation, right? I mean, I, I will hope so, but I think the only trade compensation to be really gonna be looking at is that ninth pick, because even then, like even then, like of course you gotta see how the draft shakes and see what people decide to go with it. But yeah. I mean, when you when you when you go Daniels, and I know, I know most people are not trying to hear it, but I, I've one thing about me. I got I watched tape and I watched the tape early. And yeah. I've always been watching Caleb and I always knew like, yeah, you could call him generational talent wise, but I can't see it mentally due to the system he's in. He can he be generational in the head? I know. I, I he can be, but I just wouldn't we would never know due to due, due to him being the USC. Wait, Versus I'm sorry. I'm 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 sorry. Before you move forward, I, I want to make mm. this clear so people in in the chat and are, are watching understand what do you mean by the system that he's in what what, what are you saying there yes because the system that he they they mainly run it, it, it's for one it's a mixture of, of a lot of things but it's predominantly just and not predominantly but 70 percent of it is just one read and that's either he's looking to the right or he's looking to the left. There is not too many times where you see him processing and scanning left to right or right to left. And the times that I did see it, I was like, oh, he can do it. It's, it's proof that he can do it. It's just because that's the system he's in versus what you're going to see in the league 
day one, you're not going to do that. You're not going to be in shotgun 95% of the time, which he's in, in that system. You're going to be under center. Right. And that's my thing with Jaden. Jaden is in a system that's a one, a pro style system, two, best con conference in college, and three, he took care of the ball, and 90% of his throws was NFL throws the whole game. He's sitting there processing. He's sitting there reading coverage yeah, up to down, left to right, right to left, under center, shotgun, some RPO, some read option, but he's able to do it. So my thing is if we go with Jaden, you're probably, if I have to make a prediction, you're probably going to see more instant success, but – with Caleb, I feel long term. Once Caleb get it, it's over. Ball, it's 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 as much as it's how dedicated he is, and if he's really like he says in these interviews, I want to be one of those ones. I want to be a great. He has the talent. It's all about in that head. Yeah, and what what is the what is the big uh, mindset there? I mean, I we're not QB whispers. We don't you know we're not coaches right. whatever, but. What do you think is the biggest uh, change up when you're going from under center to, to shotgun or, or is it a big change? You know, is that something you think Caleb, if he applied himself, he could get ready for through camp yeah. and preseason and get ready for week one. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like it, once again, like it's not that I don't think he can do it. It's just because in the system he is, he just didn't do it. They don't require him to do so. I don't think as much. I think what what doing that, going under center and different, it, it really does more for your offense because once you're walking up to that line and you're yeah. under center, you're basically telling the line, there's a possibility I'm going to run this ball. Versus in shotgun, it's like, yeah, I'm, especially against USC, you like, they're throwing. It's not, it's not even a thought. Versus, yeah, so, so it's more of a, when he go up to the line, not only is he building, he's it's, it's it's impact for situations for him. He's gaining that relationship with his uh his center. He's gaining that relationship with his earpiece with his corner his quarterback uh backup on the sideline. He's looking. He's paying attention to the line. He's paying attention to the court the coverage. He's paying attention to the linebackers. That's what I want to. That's what they want to see when they're drafting a quarterback. And that's my only thing. That's why I was crying for him. Like, bro, do not go to USC. I understand why you want to do it because you're going to put up numbers. But in order for a team to see if you can translate your talent to the league, it's best to put yourself into a pro style offense. Right. Yeah. I, I, I see what you're saying. And that makes sense. You want a, a little bit more range and whatever. And I have heard that, uh, um, really quick, I, I heard that JD, you know, has the edge to to be like a, a quicker day one starter with you know uh, quicker production ready to go. Whereas Caleb might you know round out take a little bit of time to get there. But like you said to your point, uh, Stevo, that once he gets it, it's he's off to the races. So that's that's refreshing to know because you know like somebody just said in the chat earlier. You know, you don't trade away Justin Fields and and not go get. And I think you and you guys, that's exactly my process. Like you, you don't guys, sit here and, and do that, and you yeah. go get what everybody is saying is can't miss because a lot of things. I, I don't like it. It's not fair, but the NFL is not fair. CJ right. is on your back. Yeah, the dude in Green Bay is on your back. They're seceding. Yeah, yep. they're on your back. Unfortunately. Yep. You know, Steve, I was talking about the the long term, you know, versus the instant, you know, and I think if you're the Bears, you got to look at long term, you know, you you don't, it's not all about making playoffs this year. It's about building sustainable success that can last you five to eight years and being very competitive. And my biggest issue with Jaden Daniels is I, I could see him being injury prone, you know, he's six foot four, 210, you know, Robert Griffin was coming out of college was 6'2", 213, similar styles of play, right? So where they can put themselves in positions to get hurt. They get hit and they get hit hard. And then that's going to shorten your career. We saw that with Justin Fields, right? And missed him. He couldn't get through a full season, but that style of play. And then we're talking about like Anthony Richardson last year. He came out at 6'4", 245, and he only played four games last year. So I think Caleb 
is for sure the guy that, you know, like I was looking at it today. It's like, I feel like Robert Griffin is a good comparison for Jaden Daniels. They both had super high upticks in their last seasons in college. Both won Heisman's, you know, Jaden Daniels went from 17 touchdowns to 37. Damn. Robert Griffin went from 22 to 40, went from 64% completion to like 72 to 74. So there's a lot of similar traits in that and how they play. And so like, but I think Andrew Luck is more of a comparison for Caleb Williams that sustained success, that style. Not not necessarily that they, they play the exact same way, but if you're looking at that 2012 draft, it's like, would you rather have the Andrew Luck of that draft or the Robert Griffin? Because I think injuries are a big concern with Jaden Daniels when you're talking about long term. Almost definitely. Um I, I yeah, of course. Like, but to me, I, I always feel like he he's going to be able to put on weight. You're with some of the best trainers and everything, so he's going to be putting on weight. But that is a worried thing. A thing I'm worried about. Yeah, it's something I'm worried about. But I think the thing with Caleb is, don't get me wrong. I've said this to him. No matter who the quarterback was, I'm expecting the playoffs, and it's strictly be based on who we have. We have a roster where this is probably the best team play. But this is probably the best team I've ever seen somebody get drafted to at number one, bro. That's that's, that's just really what it is. So, and if you're and I, and I believe Caleb is that good, he should have no problem. He should have no problem because. To me, like I said to Doug, I don't think we're going to come in here and ask him to throw it over the yard like he's normally been used to. That's not – we don't need him to do that, especially with, especially with us. Yeah, the line is progressively getting better, but it's not exactly uh, exactly where we want it to be. To me, you still need to shore up that left tackle. It's still some – Tevin is a liability at this point. I love Tevin. He's probably the most talented guy next to Darnell on the line, but he's injury prone. So, to me – to get the Caleb that we all know, we got to show up that line first. So, but until then, we're still capable and with the coaching staff that we have and the roster to win immediately. To me, by week seven, I feel like he's going to be in rhythm. Wow. I think, I, think, uh, I think you're correct. I mean, Lincoln Riley has had a lot of success in developing quarterbacks who did transition to the NFL. But I do think you're right. They don't necessarily run an NFL-style offense. But I also think that's got a lot to do with why Caleb's as good as he is. And I'm not saying not I'm not talking about what what scouts and GMs and coaches have to say about him. I mean, when you actually just watch Caleb Williams play um, mm-hmm. under pressure for the last two seasons, he's first in the league in passing yards. He's first in the league for passing touchdowns. And in the NFL, that's something he's going to have to get used to. I mean, these guys, they're bigger, they're mm-hmm. stronger, they're faster. He's going to be pressured a lot. Caleb Williams played good football when he was under pressure. And I also think. The reality is, I mean, it's unfortunate for any other quarterback who's in the draft because there's a lot of talent there. There is. I mean, I like Jaden Daniels. I do. I'm not yeah. so sure about Drake May, but, I mean, maybe if he's put in the right system, he can succeed. I think you know, a lot of people are high on Bo Nix and J- J.J. McCarthy. I don't quite understand that. Penix hey, I'm an Oregon fan, and I'm not, a, I'm not the biggest fan of Bo, but continue. <laughs> but I think – the Bears are big on continuity. That is their culture. I mean, they they retained a head coach who's 10 and 24. And I think the only reason you do that is because you, you feel like you're moving forward, you're building something, and you, you want to maintain, you know, the 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 respect that you had in the <clears> locker room. And I, and I truthfully believe this. I, I think I said it last night. Is If Caleb Williams is not in this draft, I don't think the Bears trade Justin Fields. No, I really don't. I, I think I think I think the Bears would Justin Fields would still be the Bears quarterback today if Caleb yeah. Williams was not in the draft. Yeah, yeah. Caleb is the guy. And, and 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 that's why I'm not upset like most I hate saying Justin Fields people because I am considered one, but it's some that just take it over the limit, just like some Caleb people do. But to me, it it I wasn't upset that he took his time and Missed out on some picks that per se that everybody is tripping on because I'm like, dude, one poser showed us he can get picks out of thin air, so I'm not worried. He's going to get them pick packs, them picks back some way, but he wanted to make sure if I'm going to draft this kid, the same kid I've been watching for the last two years, I'm going to make sure it's the right decision. 
He has the right character. He has the right leadership because we already have a hell of a leader here. Close, we dude. already have a hell of a talent. But at the end of the day, as my GM, why I have so much trust in him because he's has yet to lie to me. I'm going to take my time and I'm going to make the best decision long term for the Bears. And if he feel like it's Caleb was that guy, is that guy or whoever, I'm going to run with it. But to me, I'm with y'all. You don't trade Justin and get somebody else other than Caleb. No, no. If if you're gonna get rid of, if you're gonna get rid of her, you better get the upgrade, bro. Because you know that's. Let me upgrade you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I gotta that's address it. something really quick with this Yada guy. Okay, hey man. First off, thank you very much for for tuning in. Thank you for being live in the chat, man. You're going off, man. Good stuff. But here's <laughs> here's the deal. I gotta address this. Why are you expecting the Bears to make the playoffs, but the last guy was never close to making the playoffs out of three years? Okay, listen, context, up. Brother. Listen, yeah. listen up. Listen up, Yada. Here's here's the deal. We didn't have that up until what was it like mid mid to like, end, end of the season, can. three quarter of the season. We went out yeah. and got a, a defensive end That's that real re really helped out and forced multiplied our defense, allowed everybody to do their job better. And in turn, that helped us out win ball games during the stretch of, of the season. So that is part of it. You know, bu building this winning culture, this hit philosophy, bringing the guys in, changing up the coaches and everybody getting to know each other and, and all of that. And just, you know, just basically getting to know the, the X's and O's and everything that they're trying to do. I mean, it, it changes from week to week and it's only going to get better. And, and slowly, but surely you come into a deficit, you've got to create some sort of capital. The only way to do that is get rid of the old heads that cost a lot of money, get rid of them, have some dead cap. And then the next year, now you're going to have some real cap, but you can only do it piece by piece, little by little and have a draft and all this and that. It takes time. He did not. And, and, you know, obviously, when you talk about the other guy, you're talking about Justin Fields. A anybody in this building or pretty much anywhere know he didn't get a, a fair shake in the deal. OK. And like, you know, my counterpart, Brandon, just said, if, in fact, we didn't have this handsome draft class of, uh, with six guys, including Caleb, we, we wouldn't even be talking about this. If we had the draft class from last year, Justin would be, you know, finishing this year. We might even be picking up the the, the fifth-year option on the deal. But, you know, ifs, ifs or ifs, you know what I mean? So if we all had a fifth, we'd all be drunk, you know, and we're not. So, But apparently, Yada, you might be drunk because <laughs> the fact remains is this team is lit, man. We've got two bona fide – Number one wide receivers. Ballers. Justin never had that, bro. It, it, first year, I can't even remember the receiver he had. It his was best, his best receiver was his tight end, and <laughs> on a wide receiver side, it was EQ and Pitts, somebody we'll remember, we just we'll signed remember. to get back. His tight end had we'll a chip block half the and time. Most importantly, we didn't have let's no not offensive line. It was ass. Yeah, it was let's ass. Not, and let's not undervalue the decision they made. What was it? Two days after the season ended, the yeah. Bears fired. A coaching staff Everybody. on offense that just Everybody. couldn't put a scheme well, around the players' strengths that's just it's never going to win you football games, yeah. never. The Bears went out and got an offensive coordinator. That was the first thing they did after they fired Luke Etsy. And after they brought their offensive coordinator in, I'm sure they had discussions with Shane Waldron regarding what do you feel about the pieces we should add to this offense in order to succeed? And here you see them signing DeAndre Swifts and Gerald Everett's and Keenan, they're trading for Keenan Allen's. That's not just coincidence. You know what I mean? The Bears have a plan. They asked the guy they hired on offense, what do you want? What is your scheme? What do you plan on doing? What what do we need? What do you need from me? What pieces do you need? It is the first time, maybe in the last decade, decade, the Bears had a plan on offense prior to adding the pieces, right? I mean, doesn't it feel that way? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, and I, I, this is the best offensive plan I've seen the Bears come out with, honestly, in my lifetime. It, I've never seen that. Even, you know, they added Jay, Jay Cutler and they kind of threw some pieces around that. But this is, is very well thought out. It's very well laid out. And they're doing it all with the intentions of adding that rookie quarterback to this offense. And Shane Waldron is, you were talking about, you know, shotgun versus under the center. You know, Shane Waldron is here to clean all that stuff up and really help 
pull the most out of whatever guy they put in there. So I, I've never seen the Bears put this much money, much attention Bro. Much into their offense. Have you ever seen have we ever seen the Bears? Have we ever seen the Bears hire their offensive staff? The same year they're going to draft their quarterback. It doesn't often Never. happen. I mean, Justin Fields was already here when Matt Nagy was hired, wasn't he? Or yes, was no yeah. Matt Nagy? Matt Nagy no, was Matt hired. Nagy here when Justin, no, no, yeah, and yeah. Justin Fields. Yeah, yeah when so, Justin Fields yeah. already. Yeah, and he so Matt Nagy inherited Trubisky. So it's just a revolving process. The Bears have always done where this the 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 offensive coaching staff and the scheme didn't necess- necessarily match the personnel. I feel like yeah. this is the first year where they're making like an actual effort to see that those two things line up and it's all kind of happening in the best time possible because yeah. they have somebody else's first pick in the draft. That's yeah. where the expectation is. High. Too. Yeah. yeah that's, not why, only- that's why we think it's playoffs potential because yeah. no team yeah. is in this position drafting number one in, in the history of the NFL that I can think of. I mean, like, no, literally, literally nobody. The other great thing about them too, guys, is you got to remember – they didn't have a whole lot of tape on Stroud. He went down to Houston. He he went ahead and got that, you know, that uh, wide receiver that he wanted from college. You know, that worked out. I like that. I like, the, yeah. I, I like the way that, yeah, I, and I like that. I think that's a that's a ballsy move. You know, I think that's, that's a baller move. That's something that you're showing me leadership when you come forward and say, get me that guy. Say it worked for a uh, dude in the, with the Bengals, too, when he went out and got Chase, you know. Girl, so. Girl. Potentially, yeah. this might happen with with here. We might get Brandon Rice. I know it's going to be uh, on the cheap later on in the draft. We obviously would like that. to get a guy, you know, earlier in the draft, a, a, a top wide receiver, you know, Dunze, you know, whoever. You know, there's so many guys. The guy out of Texas, I like him. You know, he's not as much yeah. on the cheap, but he's later on, you know. So, I mean, anything could happen, you know, but at the, the fact remains is like what Steve-O just, you know, touched on. And, and it is real. I mean, you, you've heard uh, Dan Hampton we had in the building just a little bit ago, Steve-O. Uh, he basically echoed the same thing that Doug said. And, I mean, literally, they can't think of a time. I mean, outside of Brandon Marshall and Alshon Jeffries, we really have not seen two and, type wide receivers right now that that is that is this good, man. This is great. And that's know? the funny thing because Yada does this, but it's not even a diss. It's just – People like to throw excuses on things. It's like it's not an excuse. If you look at Joe Burrow from Joe Burrow to CJ, thank you. They all had ex receivers their first two years at least. And if they didn't have that, they either had an all pro tackle or something. And I'll tell you what, have anything. There were also quarterbacks who were able to elevate talent on their team. I mean, who knew? Who knew what Noah Brown and Tank Dell and Nico Collins were going to be? You plugged in a player like C.J. Stroud and those guys who might not have been – I mean, let's be honest. They weren't going to be as successful if Davis Mills was the quarterback of the Texans last year. C.J. Stroud's ability to, to to make the transition from college to the NFL elevated those players. And we found out, like, some of these guys – some of the guys – we all – I think we're all surprised. Some of the guys in this receiving core are really, really good as long as yeah. you've got a quarterback that can get them the damn ball. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's so, it. But also, it has a lot to do with the staff he did because a lot of people don't yes. talk about the staff. The oh, staff the they placed. I love the coaching hire. Yeah, I love. Yeah, I loved it from the beginning, from from top to bottom, from receiver coaching up. I was sitting there like, oh, y'all have no idea what they're about to do. And yeah, he did elevate it, but the reason he was able to elevate is because everybody confidence is at a sky high. Why? Because mm. they had so much confidence in their coaching. They knew yeah. the next coach I was going to, the next call that I was going to get was going to work versus Justin is out here arguing. I want to be on the center versus he wants to be in pistol. Well, I think it just comes to, in general, Bears fans are like, they're scared. Like <laughs> we've, with the, our yeah. expectations have become so low and that's really frustrating to me. You know, we're a, a charter franchise in a major market our expectations should be high you know they should be up there where we should be competing on a on a year in year out basis and a lot yeah. of a lot of people just don't expect that from us they don't expect playoffs from the bears and they don't expect those things but right now we're looking at a team and a, an organization that's making moves that we haven't seen them make right and that we know it you can you can it's okay to get excited because you see them putting those things in place 
And it just because you've never seen it before, don't mean it's not going to work. <laughs> you know, yeah, you just you just need a, a healthy season out of a rookie quarterback. They got to keep that guy on his feet, man. I'm still a little concerned about the offensive line. That's the the only the only doubts I have in the Chicago Bears and the the future situations. Can they just got to keep this guy healthy? That's the most important thing. Whoever well, let's let let's be real. That that's basically what Getzy was trying to do, and he didn't do it well. He did not do it well. But what let's 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 uh, address the elephant in the room. It is the offensive line, and it was the play calling. But Steve-O, you know what he was trying to do. Every time he tried to do one of those bootylicious freaking screen calls, it was to take the pressure off the offensive line, get the ball out fast, hopefully make a play. And it didn't work when you're doing it 500 times a game. I get that. But that in of itself is letting people know we are worried about our offensive line. We are worried about our receivers running routes down the field and being able to be open for Justin to be able to hit them. The only one that can make it work is DJ Moore on a consist consistent basis. But everybody else, I mean, that basically let us know and that's part of the reason, too, why the wide receiver mm. coach got freaking fired. Mm. But I digress. I mean, there's a lot of things to circle here, boys. Make no mistake about it. We're moving forward, and so should you, Yada. So let's start eating some yeah. solid food. I don't know who freaking didn't hug you when you were growing up, but it's not our responsibility to freaking wrap our arms around you and freaking, you know, come on, man. We we love you. We love all yeah. your input and stuff. But let's let's move forward, man. How many let's, we got? in the chat tracks we, we got 135 almost 140 yeah. in the chat man this is great there's some well, guys I, in it, here it, 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 i just i just don't thank I'm you guys just, thanks for your yeah. love <laughs> it, it, just, it just baffles me because like i don't i'll be i don't be trying to cover people but when you speak <laughs> it shows how much you know yeah, because if you're saying stop with the getsy stuff then you weren't watching the game because it's yeah. not even it's not even the most of the most thing that frustrated me about Gessie because I knew he wasn't an idiot. Don't I knew he wasn't an idiot. Oh, he kind of was. was no, 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 no. Let me, let me, let me clarify myself. Yeah. He wasn't an idiot versus he knew how to come up with some creative plays here and there. The part where he was an idiot is he didn't know when and where to call things. He didn't know when and where to call things, and he didn't think about the protection when he the made the made the whole play the, okay. the protection is the first thing you have to worry about when you're creating a whole play Lucas, so when you're sitting, me, go ahead he reminded me very much of matt Nagy. it was just can, can i try to get these players to fit my scheme it doesn't exactly work. nfl doesn't work that way it don't do work have like a player do you think when 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 the Ravens drafted Lamar Jackson, there was no coach over there, not once. They've had multiple offensive coordinators. It's like I'm going to make this guy a pocket passer. That's what I'm going to do with him. I'm going to make because that's that's the scheme I run. That this the the Bears two off last two offensive coordinators and Matt Nagy was calling plays, so he might as well have been their offensive coordinator. Both could not adjust the scheme they ran to the skill sets of the players they had on their team. And that is the biggest injustice that was justice that was done to Justin Fields. That's why he was an idiot. None of his coaches tried to utilize his strengths as a player because Justin Fields, we all saw it. There was the wild place. He did some things really well. He did some things very poorly and they consistently put him in bad situations. They consistently expected things of him. It was clear he probably wasn't going to achieve. And it feels like this offensive staff the Bears have hired are willing to like, I think Shane Waldron actually even an interview regarding it specifically saying once we get the guys in the door and we you know we stay we hit the offseason run and we're gonna see who does what well and we're gonna we're gonna adjust and, and we're gonna change our we're gonna kind of mold our scheme around the player's strengths. Exactly. Which I think he did with Geno Smith too. I not only exactly that too but the, not only that too but what they were saying in that press conference with polls really rang true because we've seen it before, Steve-O. You've been in a game where, like, you're like, dude, the, the coach is hard-headed. He ain't adjusting. It's hell. <laughs> He's not adjusting, bro. It's not working. We're getting our ass handed to us because we're not a, a, having the ability to adapt on the fly. And that's what they said when they were looking at these coaches. They, they had to check that box to be able to adjust 
to adapt and overcome, not from week to week, but inside the fucking game from play to play, not let's wait. And then here's the thing I forgot to talk to. Oh, my God. I wanted to talk to Doug Plank about this so bad, dude. What about at the press conferences when we're done and you hear guys like freaking uh, 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 what, what, uh, what's his name that went to uh, Kansas City? Freaking – Nagy, Nagy. Well, you you know, he here's the thing. We we did good on this. We did good on that. And so it's like, dude, you know what? We don't want to hear that. I want to hear about how bad we were, about how we suck, you know. Let's 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 talk about the elephant in the room. Let's say what it is. Let's not try to p- put lipstick on a pig, man. Let's try to not put lipstick on a pig because that was a horrible freaking game. You know what I mean? That's what we need to hear, especially in Chicago, bro. You cannot freaking lie and get away with it, bro. Matt Nagy was a used car salesman. That's what I (laughs) snake oil salesman. What I said. And with Getty, for real. Getty, I knew he was. I knew he was awful for this job. First game he coached in when they we were playing against the Packers. They get all the way downfield, and what do they do? They call a QB sneak with Cole Komet running it. That and then and like you had all offseason to plan, and that's what you come out with. And then he constantly and that tried wasn't to, the last time we seen it either. Yeah, no, and he constantly tried to make <laughs> Justin Fields something he wasn't. You know, if we got Justin Fields, he he embraced the run, move him around. He, he tried to force him to stay in the pocket and and make reads that he really he couldn't. He he wasn't able to make at the time. We should have used him for his strengths in our offense to make our offense hard to game plan for, and that really didn't yeah. happen. You made Justin a sit and duck in a lot of situations, and that's just bad coaching. Yeah, bro, and, I and, you, you know, it was so funny because it's just so easy to combat these things with fans because they'd be like, oh, you see his drop back is so slow. Like, he needs to work on that. So why am I putting him in shotgun? Like, why don't people ask these questions? Like, yeah. you have – see, see me – That's what shot for. So you can see the whole field before that snap comes and you can, yes. you can de- determine maybe where you're going to go – Rather than coming under center, where you got to start seeing everything as soon as you turn around after that drop back, you know. Yeah, so it, it, it was just so many things. Like, I think that the I, I always knew Getsy didn't have it, but it was just first thing I hated. His first down plays was always I didn't like them. It was it was sometimes oh, like don't get me wrong, the first fifteen plays where they're scripted out glorious. Any coach can do that. Afterwards. You all, I always, I, I write down the first team. I say, okay, and I be on Bear Central on live. I be like, all right, chat, watch this drive. I want you to pay attention to what he calls. Okay, I want y'all to go back and I want y'all to think about the second to last drive of that Detroit game we lost. They just went up twelve points. What did we do? We ran the ball up the a gap twice. Yes, and they was negative. We line. wasn't. We was not running up the a gap at all the whole game. And I'm they sitting here like, and you're going to mess us up. I said, yeah. you're going to mess us up. And we was third and nine, and they told him to drop back five and throw it. And everybody, everybody route but one was 15 yards or more. And they're sending a blitz. I say. You're 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 asking him to do an impossible an impossible task. We already know his decision making under pressure, especially when there's a blitz coming or they're in a deep zone. He don't make the best decisions. Yeah. So why would you put him in a situation where it's third and long and you call yeah. a play where it's a deep route development? Yeah, they put yeah. him in positions to fail. That, no, no, no doubt. I got no doubt. I got a question for you guys. Do you think that Ryan Poles had the quarterback thing decided while doing the interviews for the offensive coordinator position? Yes. Yes, I do. I do. Do you think that's something he was pitching I to? The whole time, Caleb? I think playing everybody with Ian Rappaport, to be honest. I think he's known this whole time what he was going to do since before the season ended. I think he's had this plan, man. I, th- I think Waldron was aware of what he was going to be coaching. I, I really do believe that. And I think that that's a big part of the moves that they've made since they brought on Waldron through free agency and then with the trade for Keenan Allen. And I, yeah, yeah. I think, I think polls had his decision made before that season ended after that Cleveland game, probably. Right. Like we, we just kind of knew that. Justin, well, we got that pick. 
Yeah, when we were when we knew we had the first Carolina moving into that spot, and the polls is like, holy crap, I got we got a chance at this. But definitely when he interviewed Waldron, I believe that's Here's what the thing said. that bothered me to to get back on what Steve-O was talking about running up the A gap two plays in a row and then making it third and forever. J Mac on on ESPN Chicago, who works with my boy uh Pat the designer, who's who's also on uh the, the Windy City Brewies. Good, great guy, man. I, I love I love mm-hmm. his content. But J Mac, he's been on our show a couple times. He goes, There is no play designed on third and forever. There's nothing, there is nothing out there that is ready for third and forever. And guess who I'm gonna double up every time when that happens? The mm-hmm. one the receiver that we had, DJ Moore. So what does that say? I gotta tuck it and run and make something happen. I got to work harder because my coach ain't smarter. Why do I got to work harder when my coach ain't smarter? Quit dumbing down, Chicago. Think about that, okay? That's what happens when you run to the A-gap twice. Coaching does fucking matter. And for anybody that says that, as dumb as the chairs they're sitting on, and they never played fucking football, okay? (laughs) So take that and smoke it in your pipe, yada, okay? Now, uh, Brandon, to answer your question, I felt like I felt like the decision was made the month that um the press conference came out when he said I'm gonna do right by Justin. I don't know if he necessarily knew that he was gonna so, do it. So I, do you think, I think he, he was pitched, do you think he pitched both ideas to the, the offensive coordinator? Yeah, like, what do you do with this guy? I think, this guy? I, yeah. I think I honestly I don't know. Of course I don't know, but I honestly feel like Shane was sitting there like I can make both work. But if you're asking for my opinion based on the situation you're in, I'm in, everybody else, football-wise, money-wise, future-wise, it makes sense to go that route, to go get a new quarterback, which is understandable. Yeah. But I feel like in this in a different world, if Shane wanted to run it with Justin, it's the same thing. He could have made it work because to me – the, like a lot of people are saying, oh, we got Shane, or oh, we keep him, we're getting Caleb. I'm like, it, he he can literally work for both. That's how much confidence but, I but, I seen but, in his work. So, Steve, do you think that <laughs> do you think that part of the appeal of taking the Bears' offensive coordinator job was the idea that Caleb Williams might, the idea that you get to develop Caleb Williams? Yeah, yeah, because you get you get you get a grace period. You don't get the same grace period if you keep with Justin because it's three years. It's going to yeah, be four yeah, years. Exactly. Is different. exactly. Yeah. So you, this is your first, especially pose. This is your quarterback of your choosing. That automatically gives you an, an extra two to three years. And with – see, now, see, see, now what my worry is, I really wish we fired Flus and possibly made – Shane, the coach, and the hey. only reason that is is because if Caleb lights it up our first year, he's gone. Shane's gone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's why they. I think they. I think that's why they hired. I think that's why they hired Thomas Brown. Though Thomas Brown was actually doing interviews. For I like Thomas. Yeah. yeah, I think he was doing inter- interviews to be an offensive coordinator. I know he was calling plays for the for Carolina after Frank Reich was fired, and I think that. Steve, what you just said, I, I really do think that Poles might have already had a plan in place for that because he brought in Thomas mm-hmm. Brown to be the passing game coordinator. But you're correct. If 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 Shane Waldron succeeds in getting the best out of Caleb Williams and, and let's say the Bears go to the playoffs and Caleb Williams is rookie of the year, there's no doubt in my mind Shane Waldron will at least do some interviews. But I, yeah. I, agree, I agree with you. I thought, you know, even if Ryan Poles liked Flus and, and, you know, he strongly considered bringing him back as the head or retaining him as the head coach, why not? They didn't even... They didn't there were too many guys out other there options. Go talk to them. Yeah. Not consider them, right? Like, just you're looking at Flus and you're like, okay, yeah, we don't need to talk to Bill Belichick. Yeah, um, I, it's people, outrageous. Like, culture guys, you know, that, and yeah. that's my biggest question with Flus is what, what is his culture and is he a leader of men? You know, like, that's the well, thing. That- I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see a lot more of that, Dustin, only in the sense that he had to overcome. Uh, the weaknesses of what what he was given when you have a guy okay. like Get- Getzy on there, and now you have to pretty much micromanage. Then your you know your defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. But let's not talk about what happened there. But you know, moving forward, 
he took over. And then, you know, when they went out and got sweat and, and then he went top five. I mean, really, if you think about it, I, Steve, I shake my head to it too. We all did in Chicago. There was a lot going on. There was a circus going on in Chicago for yeah. a hot minute. FBI, but every, but, every, there. but Eberflus vetted and hired. Oh, hold on, hold on. The, the, the FBI was there. They had freaking lawn equipment stolen. There was a lot of freaking. It was a shit show, <laughs> yeah. bro. It, it was, was freaking crazy. ridiculous. There was so yeah. much stuff going on. Peanut Tillman, they were like, Peanut, we heard you work with the FBI. What's going on over there? You know, it was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, really, it was ridiculous. And so with all of that going on and the influx of new people, I mean, really, he's year two getting into his 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 hits and all of that. So now you see all yeah. of that fast forward and that during this whole time you watch this whole group of men in the locker room they never once gave up on what they were doing and at the end they ended up being top five defense in the nfl now fast forward you give him a competent offensive coordinator brandon where he can actually move the ball downfield and keep these defensive players fresh that's the whole problem with our our team last year it was one-sided the defense was on the field way more than the offense was they didn't have a breather now if this guy caleb can come out and he can uh, manage the, the the game and keep these guys on the defense at least get Give them a breather so by the time or potentially making a field goal uh you know which obviously the lions don't know how to do if they can do that if they can do that then i think he's winning ball games and building on that week by week and i like what steve-o said because by week seven we might start seeing all of these bricks and all these chips start to add up into a culmination of them doing so much better you know brennan uh, so I keep, I, I, I've, and I, I've heard this, this take a lot. Like the, the two coaches that were forced to resign, I, I yeah. continue to hear Matt Eberflus held things together and didn't let any distract, uh, any distractions in the locker room and all that. But I mean, I, it seems to be spun in a very positive way in, in, in regards to Matt Eberflus. Yeah. yeah. He, these were two coaches that he hired. He hired both of these people. He vetted and hired both of these people. I think there's only there's one way to look at the fact that two coaches were forced to resign for activity that we're not even still sure we're still not even sure about. They kept it very much yeah. in the dark. They like to keep things in house, which I don't blame them for that. But yeah, why is Ibraflus never? He was never really held accountable for the fact that these two guys clearly made mistakes. I from what I hear, by everything I've read, it was just completely just being inappropriate. And uh, about the football, I got, I got to tell you something, Brandon. When when the feds come knocking at your door, they they didn't just find out something that happened a hot minute ago. They've been watching this dude over, even in in Indy. Okay, and that that is not that that you know Eberflus. He, he doesn't necessarily know what's going on in the dude's bedroom. He doesn't know what's, what the guy's looking at online. He doesn't know any of that kind of stuff, hypothetically speaking, of course, because we don't know what the hell happened. Oh, I, thought, I, thought, I, was, I, thought the, I thought it was what they were doing inside, inside the facility. What, what, what was being viewed inside the facility – on a, I don't want to get into it. I, I, I don't. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Trust if, if yeah. that, if yeah, the, the the illegible reports. Yeah, let's not even talk about that. Yeah, we're we're not going to be going think, into Palace interviewing Kevin Warren next yeah. month if I talk any further. Yeah. So, I think I think Flus kind of was held to the fire because for one, your whole staff that you brought along from Indy pretty much gone. So, and I'm pretty sure they said in this meeting like, yeah, this is your last chance, but. Yeah, you're not going to have full range of decision making this time. And right. You can tell by the way we went about it, especially in the offensive line. But I also will say I I'm a big guy. I'm a big guy on body language. And that was the main thing I was looking at is body language when he talked to the team. And the main thing I seen towards the end of the season, locked eyes. Nobody was just unwrapping and getting they they when he was talking and they was in the huddle, they listened and they were and when the games ended, they came up to him like I don't like it, but he they he still for some reason has a hold on this team. They still have that respect for him. But I think the for another thing, I did I think a lot of things posed that has me worried. He did a lot of things to ease it. 
bringing in Eric Washington will definitely help him because the main thing and some of the reasons why I think we lost a lot of those games on Flus is because he didn't have somebody else with him. One that's going to communicate. That was one of the things I wanted to talk to uh uh, Doug about is because he mentioned communication to me we have one of the worst communication staffs on there because uh Flus is uh, Flus is in the middle uh guess he's down there somewhere and you probably seen him talk maybe five times a game versus he, Eric he's pacing on the sideline talking to everybody and he and you got somebody else to go to to be like okay like they said um even Flus is still going to be calling the majority of the calls on defense. Yeah. But when he makes that play, like, for example, those deep, dumb games where they were just dip, dunking it, dumping it down, dumping it down, not bringing no bliss. Air Wise is going to be like, all right, bro, I, I'm not liking this, not bringing no pressure right here. Can we uh, bring some pressure on this third down? Or can we do a different package? He didn't have well, that. Eric yeah, that's so very well known for developing young players, too. Yeah. So that, like, that's my only thing that that's – that, I give him more space, but I still feel like Flus is on the hot seat. Like, if he screws this up this year, he's gone. Absolutely. I do, too. I, I think there's a lot riding on a lot of people, but I do think, like you said to your point, Steve-O, that he kept the respect of the men in the locker room. They, they made eye contact, all of that. You saw when they, they had the, the, uh, the, dab, the dab dances and stuff in there, you know. <laughs> I mean, dude, it, it was lit, dude. It was cool. They they loved yeah. him. It, there was there was something special going on there. You could see there's something because you going see on the there. Saints. The Saints was in here calling plays without talking to the coaches. We didn't have that. Yeah. Well, the only sure. thing that makes me feel good about moving forward with Flus, like you said, is all the hires that they made. People yeah. that are going to challenge him, that are going to hold him accountable. Waldron's only going to focus on the offense, and Flus don't have to worry about that. He just calls right. defense, and now he has some support in that with Eric yeah. Washington. Their coaching hires were very encouraging, but Flus, I'm still, like you said, oh, yeah. still, sour. But, I'm still definitely sour. On well, stuff. and then to to your point though, everybody thinks that Ryan Poles does all these miraculous things by himself. He's got a bunch of henchmen, a lot of staff that he's he's paid for, or it, the Bears are paying for, but he's put in position, and those guys are delegated in order to be his eyes and ears. Sure, they give him paperwork and they talk to him and give him reports and all that, but together they make they they for, formulate, make a plan, and make a decision. Same thing with uh, Eberflus, but Eberflus had to be way more on hands he had to be off he had to look at the offense he had to be the defensive coordinator he had to take care of all that he didn't get to be the guy to look at all of his coordinators he didn't get to be the ceo that thank you that he that he's supposed to be so now with all those guys like you guys just mentioned that are in place he gets to orchestrate everything and he can do all the things with the attention to detail all of those things those things better and now that he's got Williams there, now that he's got Waldron there, it's going to be a whole different, a new wide receiver coach there. It, it's going to be a whole different look. It's going to be a whole lot better. And I think they're going to get a little bit more squeeze out of that juice now that they got that offensive uh, assistant offensive coordinator out of uh, Tennessee. I really like what they're doing this year, man. It makes a whole lot of sense. Out of Carolina. Know? Yeah, Thomas Brown out of Carolina. Yeah. So let me yeah, I, 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 another question for you then, Steve. Do you think <clears throat> is there a possibility if Shane Waldron does do a good job with with Caleb Williams or whomever the Bears might draft, if yeah. if the seat gets too hot for Matt Eberflus, let's say he is let go, and we know the Bears they won't do it till after the season's over. Is there a possibility Shane Waldron's the head coach of the Chicago Bears in twenty twenty five? I will hope so. Because I mean, especially with this past offseason, is it will be a part of our DNA because Simo got promoted this year. So if you do a good job, he was the only person, and I believe the tight ends coach is the only people we kept on the offensive side of the ball, coach wise, and they got uh they got a better job. So I will hope if he's develops Caleb how we see make the playoffs or even just get scratched. If you if you put up numbers and and we're winning games, 
he should be the first person you ask to be your head coach. He knows everything. You basically built the infrastructure here. Not basically, you did. You brought you built the current infrastructure here. So you should be the one to carry us into the future. But there's hey, Steve. Dustin, I'm curious to hear your opinion on that question as well. There's kind of a dilemma there, right, though? Because like, if Caleb yeah. Williams is successful and Shane Waldron is successful in running this offense, and we're all convinced that Matt Eberflus has this defense ready to perform, then the Bears should perform pretty well, right? You know, the Bears exactly. could end up with 10 to 12 wins. So then you can't fire Eberflus in that situation to replace exactly. him with Waldron, right? So Waldron would be moving on in that scenario. The only scenario that that's possible is if the Bears underperform as a team because of Matt Eberflus's shortcomings. Exactly. But Caleb Williams shows a lot of progress because of the work Shane Waldron does. So if you're thinking of that, you're kind of thinking the Bears are going to have a rough season. You know, so I'm, I'm if they have a good season, though, Shane Waldron, you know, Matt, Matt Eberflus isn't being replaced. You know, we're going to be saying bye to Shane Waldron if if people are seeking them, you know. Uh -huh. So have you guys figured out how to say this offensive, the assistant offensive line coach that they got from uh, Tennessee Titans on February 1st? Oh, Jason, Jason, who totling? Is that how you say it? What is it? No idea. Who, who totling? From the Titans, the assistant offensive line coach they got from the Titans. I've been trying to say that since February because I was excited about it. Because if you go look at that offensive line, not only Nate Davis came there, but they also had a center that when I was talking to Lester Wilfong about, he loves that center. And we always, you know, when the, the Windy City gridiron, when they talk about stuff, they always talk about the X's and O's from the inside out. So they talk a lot about the offensive line. And they love the Tennessee Titans uh, offensive line. Now, I tell you what, the Tennessee Titans this year, they've done a lot of freaking work in the free agency. I mean, a lot of people say that you cannot win, you know, uh, the season. If you win the free agency market, I'm going to raise the bullshit flag on that because I think the Titans really helped themselves. I also think the Packers helped themselves, man. When I looked at what they did, I was really jealous about what they were doing. I'm irritated. like, bro, they are getting freaking strong. Not only can they draft well, but they can freaking hit the free agency well and they can beat our ass well. I'm like, come on, boys, let's do something here, you know. And then that's when they went out and got Keenan Allen. I was like, oh, thank you, baby Jesus, you know. So fresh my memory on what the Titans did besides, you know, force a, a really good coach to resign and overpay a wide receiver. Yeah, I didn't like that coach. Them no, moving they, over they replaced but that has nothing to do with the free agency Pollard. at all. No, that doesn't have nothing well, to do no, with the free agency, agency at all. But they overpaid Calvin Ridley, and that never works for teams. Yeah. It's not it's 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 not about that. It's about that they had a lot of cap space. They'll have even more next year, and they're trying to win right now. And when you look at their you look at right now, the Jacksonville Jaguars, they're in turmoil. They're trying to figure out what the hell they're gonna do. So in a they're gonna be in a really bad situation because they don't even trust their freaking uh what do you call it, their quarterback. They have no idea what they're gonna do right now with their quarterback, and the Colts look like booty they they look horrible right now so they could potentially put themselves aside from Houston they could put themselves in a really good position to not only possibly get a uh, uh you know a wild card but also take the AFC South I don't I know I'm not a I was left. disappointed I was disappointed with the Titans for fire and Mike Vrabel I thought he did a good job yeah, I, like I did oh I, I did, did too I'm just saying they won in the free agency they really look good in the free agency yeah, they hired Tony Pollard after they lost Derrick Henry. So I know they needed to do something at the running back position. They Pollard, got on that pretty quick. Tony Pollard I, was awful last year. Yeah, my terrible. Yeah. As soon as he got full time reps, he he regressed majorly in terms of yards per carry and and, and all of his stats really. Pollard yeah, if you look, if you look on uh, what one of my buddies that's helped me out with a lot of artwork and showed me how to create my thumbnails outside outside of Hayes. Uh, he basically took me aside and he's got one of the top uh, YouTube uh, uh, hits for uh, Tennessee Titans. And he broke down like the free agency, like nobody's business, man, and how great that they did. And I was like, man, I was really jealous because I thought we were going to attack the free agency in a different way. I do like the fact that we've got, you know, backup pieces and stuff. And we went out and got the Bills guy who slept, you know, slept through our cracks that, you know, Ryan Poles went out and got you know, originally, uh, primarily in the free agency, and Earth, then the Bills, the Bills matched it, you know, yeah. Bates. So, right, 
when I went and got that, I was like happy about that. But outside of that, I'm not really happy because Brandon just shed some light on a, uh, I think it was like 36 or 39, uh, uh, what was that, hurries or something or sacks? Uh, that, that, that center got from the Rams. Yeah, Coleman allowed 34 QB hurries last year. That was tied for most in the Ooh. Yeah, I will say, uh, Brand, yeah, Brandon, I, I will not, say this. At center, guys, it's not Coleman Shelton or Shelton this, Coleman. The center, the center that the Titans signed is better than Coleman Shelton. I'll say that the, the Titans did sign right. Lloyd Cushenberry in the right. in free agency. I thought he was a better player than yeah. Shelton was. Lester, Lester was torn when Cushenberry went to the Titans. He's like, damn it. Yeah, that's a good signing for sure. Yeah, I forgot about that. But, I mean, you know, Coleman Shelton is not going to be the starting center for the Chicago Bears team. I mean, we better hope he's not. Center is still – Oh, no. They could still draft a center in this draft, and I would be super ecstatic. And, I mean, there's guys that are deeper in the draft that you can target, like a guy like Hunter Norzad out of Penn State, who's been a starter his for four years straight and has played a lot of positions along the line, and he really – can hold his own at center. He's not athletically the best, but I mean, he's just a vet that'll go in there and, and stick his head in there and go wherever you need him. Yeah. So there are some options there for the Bears, but Coleman Shelton, I hope, is not not the starter. When okay. I hope it's not either, too. But I mean, we basically last year we signed a, a guy, we let a guy start the season who couldn't even freaking snap balls, bro. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. It was freaking horrible. So anything, I will put anything. I don't understand what polls in Ian Cunningham have against the center position or why that's their blind side as NFL, former NFL offensive yeah, lineman. I agree I with you, Brandon. I don't get it. It's amazing. They bad. can't find talent there. And, and here's the thing that's driving Olin Krutz fucking nuts. And I, and I watched him. I texted him the other day. Everything I, drives him nuts. I totally agree with you. I do not understand. He does not understand for the life of him why every time we complain when our quarterbacks get no protection and we're not getting the, the push except for the life's left side. He goes, Olin said, if you run the ball to the left side every time between the B gap and the C gap, you're getting yardage. To the right, not so much. But if you run – and I watched him after he said that, dude. He was spot on with that assessment. So what does that well, tell he me? Knows the right, what he's talking about. The, the right side it, it, the it, it, but, and and he, you know what he said, though? He goes, every time you listen to a fan or somebody else talk about the draft, he did exactly what Dustin just did. He went out and said, let's go get a guy in the cheaper rounds who's going to be good later on in the draft. Let's not go get a guy in the second or the first round and do our due diligence and go grab a guy like that. Let's go grab a wide receiver. You know what I mean? Let's go grab you know something sexy, whatever. This is Olin Krutz talking, not me, so – you know, but, but and I agree with him. Second round pick in that first pick, you don't get, you don't draft a center at number nine. You know, if you trade back, and, no, he and, said offensive line. He didn't say center. Okay. Well, he just uh, said well, offensive well, line. If you're talking but about, I'm, you know, you're, if, if it's Joe Alt, I I pull the trigger at number nine on Joe Alt. You know, but Olu Fashanu, I have I have doubts about him. You know, I know you like tracks. You like Fulaga out of Oregon State, and I could get on board with that. But I think. Uh, 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 those guys are more trade back guys. I think Alt is the only surefire guy you're going to take at nine along the offensive line. I mean, uh, and no, I would, what do you think of Latham, it, Dustin? I, I like that? Latham. What do you think of Latham? They, he, Latham is is awesome. I've seen some boards where he's ranked higher than Joe Alt. A lot of people like he's 360 pounds, guy is huge, and he can move that ass too, man. So mm-hmm. they, J.C. Latham, but again, you don't need to take him at nine. I don't, you can trade back. If you're going to take a guy like that, which I wouldn't argue against, get some more draft capital out of that number nine pick, you know? But here's a here's, here's the problem with that theology. When you look at it, 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 you know, we just had a Maserati in the building. And what happens when you go grab a mansion or a Maserati or a nice house or a really nice a, a really nice farm or a really nice uh, or a really nice house or or a vehicle or something you go get insurance on it right that's what your offensive line is we're getting ready to go get a perennial guy that is supposed to be a generational quarterback that's going to make it happen we just saw what happened without an offensive line with justin fields and by all rights right now if there's any time to go out and get that and you know you saved all those years of freaking going out and grabbing horrific offensive linemen in the draft and trying to, you know, rotate the tires on these guys that other teams didn't want in free agency. Now you go do your due diligence and you go get a top 10 offensive lineman this year, because next year 
you've got what a possibly potentially 11 draft picks with 138 freaking million. That's when you go out and get all that other fluff, you know, oh right now. I agree, I, freaking I agree with you. I agree with you, Brandon, the, the offensive line, especially the center position, which let's, let's be honest. We all know that bears two greatest needs is edge and center. And yeah. that is not, that's not a position you can put off. It's not polls has done this before. It didn't work. This bargain signing, have a guy fill a hole for a year or two. You, you cannot mm -hmm. allow this rookie quarterback, let's assume it's Caleb Williams, it should be, you cannot allow this player's health to be in jeopardy. That's the biggest concern I have with the Bears is can they keep this guy on his feet? You can't let Caleb Williams get hurt. So you cannot go into this season if you're unsure of Coleman Shelton or or um, uh, the guy they traded from, the, Ryan Bates. You, 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 you can't settle on anything. You can't settle on yeah. offensive linemen. You can't. You have to have a sure-fired yeah. result. You have to have a solution at that position. And not only, not only do these guys rank pretty low in pass coverage, but I haven't read anything great about the pre-snap stuff. I mean, the center is the guy who's going to help your quarterback learn how to read pressure. And these guys don't have a history of doing this well. They, so they have their center though, Brandon. They traded a fifth-round pick that they could have used in this draft really badly, you know, to get Ryan Bates. I, I, I really think that they did that with the intent. They didn't do that with the intention of him playing a swing behind Nate Davis and Tevin Jenkins. You know, you don't trade that for that. I think they traded that thinking he's going to be their center. Well, that's that's, well he, most of the snaps it, in the it NFL didn't work last guard. time. It's been at yeah, right guard for sure. But he's played both. But, but like, would you trade a fifth round pick for, for a guy? I'm not going to take, I, I'm not going to put that guy to protect Caleb and, and, and give up. Justin Fields and all that equity and everything that's been happening and a culmination of potentially even getting getting rid of my my coach and all this stuff, putting all of that on the shoulders. You want to go get get a guy as a center who is going to be your field general, who's going to tell your whole offensive line where to take the ball in any direction. Your center talks to your guards, your bookends. He talks to the left tackle, the right tackle. He orchestrates everything. It cannot be. You want an Olin Krutz? Listen to Olin Krutz, what he says. You want a center, a decade of dominance? Go out and pay for it. Quit being cheap. You know what, they told, yeah. Olin, you know what they told Olin Krutz? They told him, we will have you come in and be a consultant for 15 for bucks an hour. For 15 bucks an hour, I can go flip bullshit, up burgers yeah. at McDonald's, bro, and not deal with the fucking stress. So, so and, 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 plan. I'm just saying I think it's their plan. I'm not saying so Can I ask you guys a question? Can yeah. I ask you guys a question? We know what's going to happen at one. It's Caleb Williams. We know at number nine, they're probably going to take the best available player on the board. They should. Dustin's re related to it. They're all blue chip players still here in the top 10 slot. You can't, yeah. I, don't get cute. Just take the best guy on the board at a yeah, position yeah. you need. But so is there any centers that you like that are potential third round draft picks? No. Uh, Limmer, Bo Limmer out of Arkansas is really good at that number 75 pick. But like I said, I already referenced the guy that I think they should go after with that late fourth round pick is Hunter Norzad. I think people are going to be looking at him in the fifth. And I think he's, I, I think he's a great option to put at that center spot. And I think with his experience, he could start for you. I mean, I, it wouldn't be ideal, but it would be better than Ryan Bates or Coleman Shelton in my mind. But Bo Limmer is a good third round option. Do you option. like C, Do you like CVP? Cedric Van Pran? It's, isn't it S? <laughs> isn't it with is it, oh yeah, SVP? Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, no, I like him. I like him. I think he could, but I think he's developmental. He's pretty raw, you know, but I, I, I wouldn't be against that at all. No, I, I wouldn't be against the Bears taking a center with a third or the fourth round pick that they have, you know, they, they need it. And it, even if it's waiting a year to develop, you know, it, that would be a good pick for them because you have a start. I was, I was going to ask y'all, like, would you even be upset if they feel convicted on whoever they feel at this presenter position if they possibly feel like powers is that guy are you going to be upset he if he is, takes he it is that guy yeah. oh, I believe so. steve steve let me tell you something about this offensive line bro and you we can agree to disagree i still love you no no matter what it, yeah. it, even in these clowns in the chat they're just going crazy right now i love both <laughs> guys okay here's here's the deal you look at it like this the left guard and the right guard that we got tevin jenkins and and nate I look at those as, as, as swing guards and in the sense that we don't ever know what 
if they're even going to start, if Tevin's going to have another boo-boo, if he's going to have injury or Nate's going to have, you know, an injury or whatever. And I look at our left tackle. I look at him as a swing guard. He has no ass. He got no legs. He He's very strong up front. I like how he can uh, run block, okay? That was part of the thing Owen was talking about. As far as pass blocking goes and, that's, and, and, and that uh, weak side, you know, the blind side of the quarterback of Caleb, whatever, the freaking thing about it is, is I don't trust that. So I don't trust my left tackle. I don't trust my left guard. Not saying that he doesn't have the talent. If he's on the field and he's healthy, my God, yeah. you know, Jake, that no, no questions asked. I'm not throwing hate on any of these guys or shape. Injury is a real deal when it comes to freaking NFL, bro. You know, yep. instead of us keyboard warriors, right guard, Nate, same thing. Center, I'm I'm not sold. Brandon, uh, Dustin, they've done their due diligence to pull Coles and those two freaking dudes, uh, except for Ryan, but he was a backup and he was primarily a freaking guard. He's a swing guy that was on the bench, you know. So and and even then, they're starting freaking center in Buffalo. They got rid of two. They didn't just get rid of their starting center. They got rid of their backup yeah, center. Morris, they yeah, Morris. Trading for yeah. you know. It just so, center is just such a. A, a tip, it's so hard because to yeah. me, it got to go into the line of what Pose has already said. I want to build through the draft, and that's yeah. the position you kind of have to build through the draft, or yeah. you have to buy one. Yeah. And the difference, and the, and the thing is, when it comes to buying, it's very rare to see uh, one of those guys that's a center on the market because you're not letting go a good center. You're just not no, doing you're, it. You're not. So, you're not going to see him in free yeah. agency, shit, Steve-O, unless yeah. he's often injured or he's slacking. So exactly. you go get a guy that, like Owen was saying, that's going to have a decade of dominance that's going to train up your left guard and your right guard. He is a mainstay. He's going to be there week in, week out. You know he's going to be there. And that is a position – uh, the whole line, they have to be there every week. If Steve-O, if, if, if I'm your left tackle and you're the left guard, you know, you got a little bit more speed, whatever you work in, whatever. I'm your left tackle. I talk to you. I say, hey, what, what's the center say? What, what's the check down? You know, what's, what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. You're listening to that center. I trust you. I'm trusting him. And then the center is orchestrating on the right side too, man. He's seeing everything. He's picking up the freaking – the blitz – all this is going on, bro. It's very important position. It's something that you don't laugh about. If I'm going to go a little bit cheap and hit the bargain rack that Dustin wants to hit, the flashing blue light special, let's hit the right guard or the left guard. Let's not go cheap on the freaking center because potentially Jenkins might carry that team at the left guard and Nate might show up. I mean, make no mistake about it. Outside of injury, he had a debt. His mom died, you know, so that was, yeah. that was rough. I did find something else out the, about our left tackle. He had a shoulder injury that supposedly right after the season was over, he went and got fixed. Now that to me would understand Steve-O why he wasn't able to anchor down and get that push off when he's blocking. You know oh what I mean? God, that and, was, oh, could you imagine ankle. having a shoulder injury yeah. and, you know, right side? You know, now I'm trying to use the left and then, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm always trying to protect that side. That's weak. You know, and so, you know what's so it's funny to say that because <laughs> that last game against Green Bay, if you pay attention, they beat us off one move. Swipe oh, in. Yeah. Yeah. Swipe yeah. in. And it was, yeah. all, it was the shoulder that you was talking about. But, but um. <laughs> I, hey, I, I misspoke. I meant neck, but it's it's oh, the same. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 one and the same to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 it's funny. The neck control. I, I really, I, I really, I, I really want to know what's this level of love that they have for Braxton so much. Don't get me wrong, Braxton is very solid. Yeah. But I do not want my left tackle solid. No, I need him to be one of those. Well, and what if Darnell Wright goes down? If we, Darnell Wright goes down, we're we could. We yeah, and, and, and what's even funnier is is I I I almost don't want to watch a game if if Tevin's not next to next to Braggs there. I don't want to watch the game because it's it's going to be it's going to be hell. Yeah, it's going to be nothing but hell. Yeah. So I I just think if if looking at this situation. If they they didn't went to Oregon, they didn't went to the pro day. They didn't went to Oregon a couple times. If they honestly feel like he's that guy, go get him. 
and I and and that's coming from me that I don't even want, especially that we're getting a rookie quarterback. I don't even want a rookie center. But at no. the end of the day, I need the best person to protect my quarterback. I am not allowing this quarterback who is supposed to be a moonwalking Jesus. I'm not allowing him to get hurt. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm doing everything. That's why we you they asked what why we can't figure out a quarterback. You never put a you never you either had one right or you didn't have it. You had the defense, but you didn't have that. You had that, but you didn't have that. You didn't have this the the, the coaching staff. You gotta Ham, have no burger. the proper thing. Kool-Aid, right. Ham, no burger, Kool-Aid, no sugar, <laughs> uh, peanut butter, no jelly. You that's everything when it comes to the game of football. Every Steve-o. single team has to work. Oh, hold on, tracks, Steve-o. tracks, tracks. You were yeah, saying go ahead, Doug. you keep you're you're saying like I want to go bargain shopping for a center. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the Bears have shown what they're doing right now, and I expected them to go for like a cushion berry, you know. I really did because that's such a key position for a rookie yeah. quarterback. Yeah, you know, but right now, if you're at that number nine pick. Like, I'm only saying if if you're going to take that center like a Jackson Powers Johnson or Graham Barton out of Duke, you trade back and you because you're not going to have to take them at nine. So get some more draft capital to get a guy like that. But a lot of good I centers agree. in the NFL were taken in middle rounds of the draft. You know, you got to keep that in mind, too. But yeah, if I can get one of them at 10, I believe. But if I can get if I can get it in the top 10, if I can get my quarterback and my ride or die that's going to hand me the ball. Hike the ball to me every time from for my decade of do- dominance and beyond. I'm gonna make that. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna get my my quarterback and I'm gonna get my center and that's it. I ain't gonna worry about it for the next 12, 10, 12 years. That's I'm not I'm not I'm deal. not even thinking about a wide receiver honestly. But now but, if you want to go yeah. get some fluff in the later rounds, you take your third and your fourth rounds. Yeah. You force multiply them, trade them back, and yeah. now that makes you feel good about everything. Because instead of you know having four, now you got six draft picks. You know. No, I'm just uh, saying the value isn't there on that position. I, that's just the reality. Like you're not going to be at a center. You, you know, at center you're. It is. I think the the value is there. The Look, I think the value is there. It's just you don't see the value because they're no, never no, they're no, never no, allowed on that offense. The league operates, guys. You don't have to spend a number nine pick on a center. No one does it. Not even a guard. Like that's it's so rare. When was the last guard drafted in the top ten, guys? When was the when was a uh, Detroit like, a couple years ago running back drafted right yep. away in the first round? I mean, they went out and got that guy. When you have uh, uh, when you uh, when you have conviction of who your guy is, you got to go get him. I don't. Yeah, I don't yeah, really care. I don't really care. I think. I think right. what Dustin's. I think what Dustin's saying is, if Powers Johnson is what the Bears want, which they absolutely could, they might. They they have the ability to get more draft capital and still get Powers That's Johnson, true. which you don't spend a nine. Which if you I take, agree. Yeah. If you take Powers not Johnson, he's projected by all means between eighteen and twenty four. So if you draft Powers by every it's source, reaching. so if you it's draft reaching. Powers Johnson at nine, it's a reach. And if you trade back and get more draft capital, let's say you trade to that eighteenth pick in the draft, and you take Powers Johnson there, that'd be a little more responsible. And get yourself another third uh, round pick. Maybe a fifth to go with it. That's, That's a top ten I pick. You'll probably like, get a second. I, I, I agree. I just That's possible. To me, I feel like it, it's a possibility that he might go a little bit earlier than most people expect. Yeah. That's just and, my and, thing. And if you those, don't have to, don't do it. But any of those, th- yeah. any of those offensive linemen, because they're turning up into being a premium, because now what you're doing is you're protecting your franchise quarterback that is basically he is going to cost you the most on the whole entire – when you look at it, I think uh, our our highest uh, is like tw- – Keenan Allen is like 8% of our cap. It, could you imagine what the cap would be at if we had a quarterback like uh, Kirk Cousins at 47, 48 mil on that clip? You know, you look at that, that's probably like a quarter of your whole entire freaking cap. You know what I mean? What and you're you're gonna go do your due diligence and protect him. I don't think anybody says that you reach when you go out and you get your your offensive lineman to protect you from mayhem, especially when you have shown the entire league that over three years, Caleb or Justin Fields had been sacked 130 times in less than three years because he never made it through one full year. 
And now you're going to go out and go get another kid, bring him in and not protect him. You go well, get think, him in the first. I don't, round. I don't I know think you're an old lineman, man. And I, and I understand how important I was an old lineman yeah. too in high school. You know, yeah. I know you're a big ugly and you want, you want that position, those, that position solidified, you know, and I totally agree with you. I'm not diminishing the value of the offensive line. What I yeah. am saying is you're diminishing the value of your pick. If you take a center at number nine, that's but what I, I, will, I, get you. I get you. I get you. I, I agree with you on that, but at the same okay. point in time, there's other parts in that offensive line that can be solidified. That's that oh, if you take, if you take, if you take Joel, team. if you take Joel, Joel to nine, yeah. that's a yeah. great yeah. decision. Yeah, oh, that's what Joel, I'm saying. If oh, yeah. Joel, the value is there. If to Joel, me, to, I was to say, nine, to me it's, it's almost a must do. But yeah, I will tell me, you, I, I would take that false gold if we didn't get Keenan Allen. If we only had one wide receiver, and DJ Moore. I would be looking at that sexy receiver at nine. Yeah. Malik yeah. Neighbors is I, I, fool's gold. Malik Neighbors yeah. is going to be a stud. He is the next Odell Beckham. No false gold in the sense that you. we only have one fucking but wide I'm, receiver. Now we yeah. have two first wide receivers. <laughs> if we only yeah. had one, then I would be like, I want to go get a wide receiver instead of an offensive lineman. Yeah, wide receiver is a luxury in the draft. It's not. Yeah, a, you guys say it's a luxury, but Keenan Allen might not be here yeah, after this year. I'm Unless sorry, bro. We got contract. we got way too many holes on both trenches. You win the game in the trenches. We defensive get a, we, end I, is a big lead. Defensive end. That's why I say if you're, if you're going to keep nine, the only wide receiver I'm getting is if somehow Marvin drops the nine. There is no other wide receiver I'm thinking about getting after. I don't like Odunze and Nav- I don't think the talent falls. I like the dude. No, no, no. That's not what Neighbors I'm saying. That's right not, there with that, that's not that's not what I'm saying. I do I like Rome. I definitely like Malik. And I will take them at nine. But based on the team we currently have, we have too many holes in that O line and that D line. If you're gonna get used that ninth pick, it better be for a DN or a D tackle or an O line. Alt alter verse. Alter verse would be both. I'm which that's that's my both one and two, or, or my third is lot two. I just have, and, and, and you know what, Steve? Also, and you know what, so, like I agree with you, Steve, because like Dustin said, Keenan Allen's under contract for one season. He might be a free agent next year. I do believe the Bears try to restructure that contract to get him oh, yeah. to get him. To, but you have nine picks next year. Wide receiver is a pretty deep position in the draft every I do, year. I, it's I, especially I do, deep this year, though. I do think the Bears will have the possibility to address wide receiver if Keenan Allen does depart. They have the possibility to address that next year. Right yeah, now you're working do. with you're working with four picks. And if that's what they do, I don't it's really hard to believe Ryan Poole stays with four picks. If they do stay with four picks, positions of need are going to be what I think he addresses. I, I really it, 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 if so let me guys ask you guys a question. They didn't really do any due diligence in regards to the edge position during free agency. There was a lot of edge rushers out there, even value edge rushers. We didn't really talk to any of them. Does that imply to you that the Bears have plans for addressing the edge in the draft? That or he might have something about Pose is he always pays attention to who gives us problems. So I won't be surprised if we see another like my test type of sweat type of trade in midseason. Don't be oh, surprised okay. at that either. Okay. He's got two <laughs> second round picks that he can work with, but I don't I don't know if I is Ryan pulls his trade with trades with draft capital is never it's hit and miss. Allen. It's hit and miss for sure. Yeah. It's tough when you give up the draft capital and then you're signing the guy to a big deal. You know, with Montez Sweat was a great addition to this team, but you gave up a second round pick, which is why we only have a uh, one reason why we only have you know the four picks right now, and then you had to pay him that big money, which I don't know if he would have commanded that on this market when you look at what a Daniil Hunter got. You know, it, it, the Montez Sweat got, might have gotten overpaid, but the Bears put themselves in a position where they had to do that, and he's performed. So it, it's been it looks like it's worth it right now. But I I just think getting if you can get a Jared Verse, if that's the guy you go with, I think that locks down your defensive ends. It puts basically another Montez Sweat on the other side, from what I can tell. I do believe the Bears see edge. As a high as as a as a greater need than they do wide receiver and left tackle, I know Steve. I agree with you. You want 
you want that that rock there. You want that boulder that can't be moved in left tackle. But I do think they think Braxton Jones they is like serviceable. They love him, bro. <laughs> they love him. I don't know <laughs> what he's <laughs> done. I don't know what he's done, but I they love that dude. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> And, and uh, he's not garbage. And, and if, don't get and me if, wrong. He's, and yeah. if Ever Flu says anything to say about the the the, the potential direction that the Bears go in the draft, if Ever and Poles are working on that together, I would I would expect an edge draft of that ninth pick. I really would. Yeah, I like I like Bears. Uh, my only concern about Bears is is he raw? But who's not raw coming out of college? Especially at his position. Verse reminds, he, he, Will, Verse reminds me of Will Anderson. He's he's very powerful. I agree. He's very he. I mean, they said by every measure when when he did at the combine. You know, a lot of these guys, these top potential picks, no, they don't, they don't need to be at the combine. He did he did the bench press. I think he did like thirty six reps. And the guy there. the guy blew people's minds at the combine in terms of strength and. The Bears kind of run, you know. The, you, I, a lot of people say Dallas Turner. He's got the speed. He's he's a loose. He's got the moves. He's got hands. But versus, yeah, just I don't a, know if he got that dog. A, yeah, versus got that dog. Move. Versus just a big dog. strong guy. Yeah, we've talked about that. Dallas, Dallas Turner reminds me more of a three-four outside linebacker edge rusher. Yeah. And, and Agreed, not, which we time. really don't need. We don't need that at all. He's a, like, a, defense, like a yeah. Josh Allen type player. Yeah. Josh, perfect. That's a hey, perfect. Cracks, anything perfect going on in the chat? Hey, Steve. About hey, Steve. Oh, uh, I forgot to tell you, man. I've been wanting to tell you for a minute. Uh, Marvin, uh, because your your guys' chat is going off like this, e even more so, like way more so. But uh, I I'll tell you this much. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., do you know what his bench press is? No. 385 pounds, like 37 times or something like that. Yeah. What? Do you know his deadlift? Yeah. In his basement? <laughs> I know it's know if, he didn't, I know it's he didn't pass that in, on anything. But, but for hey, a it's squad at 500 is crazy. Yeah. 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 But I'm saying the the bench press 380 freaking 385 or 389 like 30 something times for a wide receiver. Yeah. That's it's nuts. Crazy. I guarantee your daddy didn't do that for sure, man. <laughs> oh no. No. His dad barely, his dad didn't even want to be there. Jay he just Cutler. wanted to do it go. <laughs> Jay Cutler benched 275 26 times. He opted to do the bench press of the combine when he wasn't required to. While smoking a cigarette. Smoking a <laughs> cigarette. Yeah. While, while looking like Justin Bieber at the time. Yeah. <laughs> while, while looking like while looking like his cat just died. No. Well, he always looked like his cat just died. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be here. That's what he looked like every time I was. I don't want to be here. I hate it. Oh, I can't stand. He has so much talent. He get on my nerves. Yep. Yeah. Always. Well, I fellas, I think that's about it, man. We I think we beat it up pretty good. I'm I'm really yeah. excited about April 24 draft, man. Steve, it was a pleasure. I was so excited to have you on. I'm glad you were able to it. be on with Doug Plank. If we have any other celebs, I'll, I'll make sure we uh, notify you guys. We got. Some coming up pretty soon, and we're excited about those, but we got to just get those dates dialed in. So, man, uh, can you tell everybody really quick, as if we don't know already and I haven't dropped it like it's hot like 85 times, mm -hmm. where, where you guys are at and where we can find you? Yeah, you can find me on Chicago Bears Central as well as NBA Central as well as Chi Town Sports Central as well as whatever else we have. We have a ton of channels. We do a lot of things. Um, we're trying to tap in as much things as possible. But most frequently, you can get me at Chi Town um, at NBA and Bears Central. Dude, these these guys are doing the Bulls so much as they do the Bears. Sometimes in Bears Central, they'll say Bulls, <laughs> <laughs> uh, bro. Dude, Imagine how many you have to do every game? We're, we're live calling every Bulls game, live, live and I don't even want to do it. These trash. I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's many, tough. It's tough right now. Tell them how many shows you guys did within the like the last like ten days or something, isn't it? Like, uh, um, well, week, week, the first week of free agency, I think me personally, I did over twenty five. Yeah. I think as a channel we did twenty one or twenty two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was so, it was a lot. It was a lot. It was crazy. Y'all killing yeah. it, man. Thank you for being here. Y'all are killing it. Oh, yeah, thanks, sure. Steve. Hey, can't wait to have y'all on. Pleasure oh, to meet you. Love that. Yeah. So pleasure to meet you too, Brandon. 
and the other I, Brandon. <laughs> and <Justin. laughs> all right brother y'all have a good one all right take care. Guys. so yeah man that was uh steve-o man that was great to uh pick his brain and talk to those guys they're 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 deep and they're in it man i i love talking to those guys man brandon you had some really good points so did you too D uh dustin i was really happy to see how many people were uh new guys in the chat too uh there's like three or four of them i uh all right named and stuff. I did have to uh, mute somebody a little bit ago, so that that, that was enough. Like there was enough <laughs> to back there to to ban him for a you little were getting bit. Heated so. on him, man. You were getting heated. <laughs> I was. I'm like, well, he, the, here's the deal. He travels, Stevo, all these guys from Chicago Bears Central, uh, even Keith that we had from uh, the other group. No, had, yeah. They travel well. When they bring their guys, they also bring. And then they warn me before they come on, like, hey, bro, I just want to let you know this troll's coming. So I was forewarned about this. That's guy. how you know you arrived, though, I guess, if you got a troll following you around everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so, well I, I guess I'll never have that troll because he's he's not welcome here anymore. So well, hopefully but you I'm just sure, made, uh, made one. <laughs> what's that? I said, hopefully you just made one. <laughs> right. No, but uh yeah, man. Uh, you guys got any uh, parting gifts, any uh, comments or anything that you'd like to, uh, you know, shout outs or anything? Yeah, I, I do want to touch on something. It's very irrelevant in regards to a Bears podcast, but the the Bulls, who obviously have Patrick Williams and Zach Levine on IR for the rest of the season, did just sign Javante Green again, who I thought was pretty productive um, when he was on the Bulls in his last stint. So I, I am close out I, on Javante Green, bro. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Dustin. Yeah. Well, it was only a ten-day contract, but it's still a contract, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to see him back. He was he was out there. He wasn't on the team, man. The guy played. The guy plays. The guy plays his ass off. He wasn't on. A, he was not on the NBA roster. I feel like I, I I don't know. I feel like he's he's a player that's earned at least a role a role play. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would just say, man, this was a great show. Doug Plank was awesome. He went for Doug an Plank hour. is awesome. He went for an hour, guys. Like he just he just kept going, and it was an great hour. To hear Dustin, he, to he, say, he would have gone for another <laughs> another <laughs> hour. He would have been. He would have pulled an all nighter, bro. As long as, long as he could sleep. talk, as long as he could talk about hitting people, he'll go on. Yeah, yeah. It's like okay, what about Caleb Williams? And then he's just like, you know, one time I hit a quarterback so hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and those quarterbacks they can't take those hits. So it, it, everything went back to that man. So you know what his mind state is still to yeah. this day, and that's impressive, honestly, to keep that. Well, it's, keep that it, in is, you. it is the one thing he did the best for sure, man. No doubt, man, no doubt. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not too familiar. You know, I'm, I'm, thir I'm 35 years old. I was born. I was negative three years old when the Bears won the Super Bowl. And I'll be honest, I've, I've started to watch these, this film, these highlights more 30. now. And uh, he just, I, I watched some Doug Plank for the last two days. I've been watching Doug Plank highlights, and the dude just got. Lance Briggs, it reminds me of Lance Briggs, which he obviously at outside like he got so low on players. I mean, he was hitting them at like the thighs. And there's just like he had this force that like, there's multiple highlights where he'd hit somebody and the their legs would kind of fly over the top of them. You know what I mean? It's like, good God, he's violent. And he's no, like no. I said, like I guess I said he was highlights. super modest, man. He's sitting here to calling himself an average player, like People don't hit like that anymore, man. I don't think he was calling himself an average player. I think he was saying he had average physical ability and he used a mentality to turn himself into an above average player. I think he just said it in a humble kind of way, you know. Let's let's, let's address think, this really quick with uh, Chicago Pro uh, Sports Essential. Why block someone who's saying his opinion just like we all are? Embarrassing, shaking my head. It wasn't about uh an opinion that he was saying it's when you get personal and he was getting personal with us okay let's as long as we keep it clean we're good in here but there's no need to start you know getting personal so that's that's where we draw the line up oh no you saw us disagree this whole time you know and go yeah. back and forth on stuff like that's that's yeah. all welcome and good well, you know? and that, and that, yeah know, just like we did with the with the, the the offensive line, wide receiver, defensive, yeah, line, yeah, you yeah. know all that. Well, stuff. let me just say this too: we we more than welcome 
we want that we want viewers we want comments we we especially want comments we want you guys to bring us interesting points that we can debate and we're not yeah. always going to agree with you but the, the bottom line is if we if we don't agree with you if you have to be able to kind of take it on the chin you know what i mean like it's it's not yeah. a position this is sports we're still talking about sports at the end of the day yeah we don't we don't, we don't need to we don't need to get to get shitty with one another because we disagree on a sports that's what's what's all about what the sports debates wouldn't exist if it wasn't for disagreement right yeah and you know what you you're not held hostage here you don't have you can unlike you can unsubscribe you don't, don't have to stay here <laughs> you know we're we're not we're not going to check all your boxes you're not going to like everything that we have to say you might not even like tracks you might like the other brandon or might maybe you guys all like dustin who knows but so we, we we got 155 156 right now watching nice. so somebody likes this this tra train wreck or shit show or you know <laughs> and, and i'm just like i'll say it best like dan hampton said I'm just the monkey that's driving the fucking bus. Okay. I'm not, I'm not a nobody special here. You're so. a monkey driving a limo tracks driving. A oh, limo. did he say a limo? He didn't say bus. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Give yourself more credit than that. You're not driving well, a bus. You're driving. I a can't limo. afford a limo. I can't even rent a limo, bro. What are we doing here? <laughs> I don't that I can't even afford a bus. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy Dustin a couple rounds instead of one round because freaking, I got the date wrong for freaking, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> the other day, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I only you drove know? three hours, man. It's cool. <laughs> 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 now nah, we had some beers, we had some food, and we had a good conversation. It was, it, it ended up being worth it. You know, I'm glad we got to meet face to face, and I'm glad we yeah. get to keep doing this. This is was a yeah. Great yeah I'll be, I'll be honest. I was envious that I didn't drive three hours to not see Will Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin somehow spun it that way. Nazi will Purdue I, that I yeah, I'm always looking on the bright side. Wrong. I couldn't even spell it right. I had to get freaking bitch slapped in freaking private chat by hey, you know, you spelled it like the freaking uh college dumbass. I'm like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am fixing everything, only to find out that it wasn't the real problem I should have fixed. It was that it was the March date. 30, date. not the twenty yeah, third. <laughs> all good man we had a great time I, I yeah mean, we did man i was glad to meet you and i'm glad brandon you know turned me on to you because you know i'm kind of turned on myself but uh <laughs> take it easy wait until we're in a private setting all right Try dude i will I, I will tell you one thing as big as dano is like I'm obviously a freaking giant right but i was expecting like this big viking he is still a big man but i yeah, was yeah. expecting like this big like huge viking dude like you know what i'm saying so i i was like okay he's not that big at least i have the freaking oh nah, he kind of looked like the, he kind of had the build of one of those dwarfs from uh the the hobbit <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> but oh, those guys first, are badass that... i'm not knocking dano I, dano was no. awesome we had a great time yesterday i'm just yeah. giving shit man but yeah you look you, you're short and stocky man like you'll fuck some shit up you got oh, was yeah. that the first was that the first center of gravity <laughs> brandon was that the first Me time too. you met dano in person yeah it was the first time i met dano in person i met him through coop and that's basically how this works you're one of the very few rare people that i've actually followed and looked at your uh comments and then i was like you know what dude let me see a video you know and then you know and, and you nailed it and then the rest was history but it's always been I, i'm always looking for that co continuity hey, I'm hey Brandon, I, i'll never forget our conversation about ryan bates <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. what a strange thing to build a relationship on. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome the man I'm, 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 I'm so, no, real talk man I'm, I'm so grateful you brought me on you do you do a really good job here you do i, I love what you do here um it's exciting it's, it's the future is exciting because i think you you bring the heat, man. It's fun. Wait, it's fun. you make it fun. Wait, wait, hold on. This guy is giving me a freaking chubby right now. I love this. Look at this. John Goodman. Yeah, I love that. That's great. I look like hey, well, that's that's just like your opinion, man. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, it's a big Lebowski reference. Yeah, yeah, we got it. <laughs> Does that mean that no the my, wife, coming. My, my wife's a lot better looking than, than Roseanne Barr? I hope we're not going there. Okay. <laughs> Most people are. 
than most people are. It's not like a high bar, but it's not a, high bar. a high bar, Roseanne bar. I'm I'm a better looking woman than Roseanne bar. Better looking. Hey, the the Clydesdale you were standing next. No, I'm not going there. Uh, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, let's uh let's uh hey man, thank you everybody that's in the chat. Thank Thanks, you for everybody. everybody that's you know that's here, that's that's watching us. We love you guys. We're glad that you guys came out and paid homage to Doug Plank. That meant so much to me. I want to fill the building when these guys come out that are our beloved Chicago Bears that have done so much for us, changing the culture. And these are these these guys that we can always point to and look at and say, this is what we need in our, you know, in our building. This is what we need. This is our history. This is all of it. I, I love the fact that you guys showed out and, and came and, and did that. And now I guarantee you hearing that there was hundreds of you guys, you know, showing up for him, he'll definitely be more than happy to come back. And uh, I, Hey, listen, I'm pretty sure there's more of where that came from. He's got lots of stories. If if we get to unpack some of his business stuff, unbelievable. This guy, oh. freaking, he's made some sick money. I mean, I want to talk about when he was three or four years in and he started to see, like, the, the potential, like, being on the other side of it. He started to make some crazy-ass investments. And I really think that's, like, even myself as a refresher, even though I've heard him talk two or three times about it, this guy is very intelligent, man. He's very cool. So anyways, yeah. what's that? He was a great guest. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky I'm looking him. forward to you guys. You guys said you already ordered that book. Uh, yeah. I'm going to read that book for sure. Yeah. 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 yeah it looks good. Yeah. I want to read, I want to read Kramer's book, honestly. Kramer's. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In regards to his suicide attempt and overcoming depression and and all yeah. that stuff, it's his his son moving. and all that. Oh god. Oh yeah, that's all tough. That's yeah. all tough. You know that guy's been solid for us too, man. He's been helping us out a whole lot. I'll I'll talk to you guys, but when we what do me a favor as soon as we click the end video, let me talk to you guys uh, backstage real quick before we go. All right, all right guys. Guy town up, bear down. Thanks everybody.